So I got to do what I got to do. It's time. You don't give a damn no more how low down you are. How funky you have become. How rotten you look in the eyes of the world. You don't give a damn no more. You have lost your sense of shame. So you're no longer human beings. You have become a race of animals. We lost Martin Luther King because America did not want to hear a word that would make her a just society. So America kills your leaders. America kills your leaders and then names streets after them. But the leader's dream dies and you ride on Martin Luther King Boulevard. You see, when you describe the Christ figure, both from the revelations and from Daniel, you get a dark man. You don't get a Caucasian. You say, well, what difference does it make? If it didn't make a difference, why did you paint him white? You give us scripts to play. We're so happy to be in a movie. But you write the script. And you write us in as clowns and buffoons. You know what you're doing to our mind. You know what you're doing to our psyche. I never did that to Jews. But some Jews did that to black people. We build your country and we get nothing. We build your business and we get nothing. We are the music industry and we have nothing. You suck the blood of the black community and you feel we have no right now to say something about it? What do you think I am? God gave us sex and we turn it into an ugly thing. God gave us color and we turn it into an ugly thing. God gave us creation and we turn it into an ugly thing. We have turned against God and now God has turned against us. Minister Louis Farrakhan. Why do you think there has been so much resistance to me having you on the show. I've even, not just white people, I've had black people tell me what you need to do is get sick on Wednesday. True story, get sick on Wednesday and cancel Thursday, Friday. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Unfortunately, millions and millions of people on this earth are deprived of that particular truth of which Jesus spoke. And the great fear of those who hold our people in captivity is that our people will come into that particular truth that will make us a free people, justified and equal before God and man. If I were on the Donahue show, as I have been invited again to Donahue. I've been invited by Barbara Walters and Forrest Sawyer, Connie Chung, and um, Tom Brokaw and Katie Couric and Mike Wallace and How about Oprah and Montel? No. But the point is, (laughs) Arsenio, that as long As long as I'm on a show where they think I will be seriously opposed, it's all right. But you, as my brother, would allow me to stand here or sit here and, as they think, give me a free ride or a Valentine show. Then their fear is that nobody will oppose me and, as a result, truth will get out and people might be made free. But as we talked about this show before all of this controversy arose, I told you then and I tell you now, ask me anything that is in the hearts and minds of your listeners, white or black, Jewish or Gentile. And if I cannot answer those questions with truth, then I have no business being on this show. Let's start with... (laughs) 
this, um, this. Um, let us start with, because I, I have gone into the neighborhood and I've gone to the furthest suburb trying to find out what's on people's mind, my research department. Um, one question that comes out of the neighborhood most often is, who killed Malcolm X? Since the movie, there are a lot of people who feel, you know, Minister Farrakhan had something to do with that. And I know you've heard it. Yes, I've heard it. More so now than ever before. When Malcolm was assassinated, if you would go back and read all of the accounts, the name of Louis X, as I was called at that time, was never, ever, ever mentioned. Why now? You know, brothers and sisters, we have to look at motives and intentions. Whenever you see a dead body exhumed, somebody has ordered it. Someone in high authority has given permission. Whenever a great leader of ours dies, we respect and honor their memory. White leaders, when they die, their Memory is respected and honored, but white folk don't follow their dead leaders. White folk understand that the dead are gone and the, the burden of life is with the living. Malcolm X, on the day he was assassinated, the papers came out, the New York Times saying, quote, the apostle of hatred is dead. If Malcolm X, 30 years ago, was the apostle of hate in the eyes of the New York Times and in the eyes of the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, 30 years ago, Malcolm was the leading black anti-Semite. What happened in 30 years to clean up his image? And I suggest to you that the reason my name is being brought up today is because Farrakhan has inspired the hearts and minds of tens of hundreds of thousands of black people all over America. And because they don't have a living man that can fight against me, that they can put up against me, although they continue to try, they desire now to raise the dead. And because that is the saddest episode in the history of the nation of Islam, of which Farrakhan, who was a student of Malcolm and an adorer of Malcolm, but became an enemy of Malcolm when Malcolm split from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Because of that fact, and because of the fact that I wrote an article in the Muhammad Speaks saying that Malcolm was worthy of death and several months later, Malcolm was assassinated, the press would like for black people to believe that Farrakhan had something to do with the assassination of Malcolm, not because they really believed that, because if that were so, the grand jury should open this case again and bring Farrakhan before courts of law. But the press does not want to do that. They want to try Farrakhan and the nation of Islam in the media and castigate us in the media. But that is only because what is in my mouth is freeing black people all over the earth. And so if they can discredit me, then the truth that I speak will be of non-effect. I don't know who murdered Malcolm. But I believe with all my heart that two men who belong to the nation of Islam, who were picked up after Talmud Hale was picked up at the Audubon Ballroom, have been charged and found guilty of a crime that I believe those two men were innocent of. During the trial, Talmud Hale, who was the brother that was caught at the scene, said in court that the other two men were absolutely innocent. And when he was asked to name the co-conspirators in the murder of Malcolm, 
He refused to do it at that time. So those two innocent men went to prison for 26 years of their life. But during that time, Talmadge Haya, under Kunstler, named all five of those who were with him in the assassination of Malcolm. And Kunstler tried to get the government to reopen the case, and they refused to do it because it suits the government's purpose to say that the nation, and that's a big name, the nation killed Malcolm. You cannot try the nation of Islam for what a few men have done any more than you can try the Pope of Rome or the Catholic Church for what errant Catholics do, or you can try the rabbis for what errant Jews have done or any other religious group. Um, journalists have also accused me of doing this show for ratings. It's deeper than that, and you better ask somebody. I'll be right back with more Minister of Spirit. Um, got a call from Whoopi Goldberg, who was very confused about this night. She's black and she's Jewish. I've uh, gotten calls from Irv Rubin. I've talked to many people in the community. I've heard terms like the new black Hitler. Why would you book him? Respond to those three words, new black Hitler. <laughs> I should dismiss it. I should not even dignify that foolishness with a response. I have never desired to put another human being in an oven. I have never taught that Jews should be exterminated because of their Jewishness. If I am a righteous person, and that I'm trying to be, I can never hate or dislike a person because of their faith. All Muslims believe in Abraham. All Muslims believe in Moses and all of the prophets that came to Israel and the scriptures that they brought. And all Jews who follow those scriptures are our brothers in faith. The Quran does not tell us that Jews who believe in God and the last day will meet anything other than salvation. So to call me a Hitler, I ask myself why? It is because God has blessed me with oratorical skill. And God has blessed me to be able to move the masses of our people as no other black person in recent times has done. And those who have oppressed us are so frightened that we will move our people to take vengeance against them for the evils that they have poured and continue to pour on our heads. While the reverse is true, we have been blessed through our suffering to become an exceedingly great people potentially. And it is my assignment, my mission as a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to raise black people first and foremost up from the grave of ignorance and mental death. And so when I look at Time magazine and see my picture on the cover, and then these words, ministry of rage, I ask myself, what is a minister? A minister is a servant. The preposition of denotes possession. So here's a servant who is possessed of what? Violent anger and fury, yes, I, like you, am angry over the condition that our people live under. I'm angry at oppression, I'm angry at exploitation, I'm angry at the incessant tricks that are being used to deprive our people of justice. But I could never transform human life with rage, with hate, or with bitterness. But those whom God blesses me to teach, I bring them out of the prisons and I clean them up 
from drugs and alcohol. I teach our women the dignity of themselves as women and take them from a low life and encourage them to live the dignified life of a righteous woman. We put people together who were ignorant and make them lovers of knowledge. And then we unite our people and pool our resources to do things constructive for ourselves because we're tired of laying at the foot of white people, begging them to do for us what we can unite and do for ourselves. So my ministry is not a ministry of rage, but it is a ministry of love. And the problem is that we are teaching black people to love themselves. But look at what has happened. You brought me here to your show. And what happened, Arsenio? You incited so much rage, so much venom, so much hatred that now they don't want your show to show in the marketplace that it has shown they've threatened you that they will take you off of the air and ruin your career. Farrakhan didn't do that. That's hate. That's bitterness. That's venom. I introduced you to one of the producers here, my partner in crime since the old days, Marla Kell Brown. She's Jewish and a friend of mine. Do you have any Jewish friends? No. I don't have any Jewish friends, not because I don't seek Jewish friends, but my whole ministry has been to black people in the last near 40 years. And it's only in the last 10 years that I have uh, come under fire, so to speak, as an anti-Semite, that I have been reaching out uh, to uh, the Anti-Defamation League and other Jewish rabbis to let's sit down and talk. And so on a, an occasion, uh, several rabbis have visited my home and had dinner with me, and we've discussed very candidly the problems between blacks and Jews. And uh, I have visited their home mm -hmm. and had dinner. But I don't consider that friendship. Right. You know, we have a lot of acquaintances. When we talk about black-Jewish relationships, the average black person in the ghetto does not have any relationship mm -hmm. with Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Can I can I grab this? Sure. <laughs> this this book, the secret relationship, and this this is yours. Um, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. I, I've seen you hold up this book during conversation. I found an interesting remark from a doctor who is black. His name is Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., chairman of African American Studies at Harvard. He says this is the Bible of the new anti-Semitism. Mm. What's your response to that? Oh, boy. <laughs> and I wish I had two hours you like know, Donahue. A Bible, a Bible should never be denigrated. The word of God should never be denigrated. This book, The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, is compiled by the Nation of Islam Research Department as an answer to the charge that Louis Farrakhan is anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. I said that there were Jews who were involved in the slave trade. We have always heard that Arabs were involved, that Africans were involved, that white Europeans were involved in the slave trade, but we never knew much about Jewish involvement in the slave trade. In fact, there are many Jews themselves who do not know their involvement in the slave trade. So we researched. This is not a book written by us. This book is quotations from eminent Jewish rabbis, scholars, and historians. And we are only quoting what they say. So if it is anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. then Jews themselves are the ones we are quoting. A respected Jewish rabbi said to me that this book is a great calumny against the Jewish people because it says that Jews were major in the slave trade while he contended that Jews were only 2% of the slave trade. Now, I told the rabbi, since we quoted eminent Jewish scholars, rabbis, and historians, 
if he will go before the world and denounce every scholar that we have quoted as a liar, then I'll throw the book away. But this book says, and I'm quoting now, Jewish scholars, that the bulk of the slave trade in Brazil was in the hands of Jewish settlers. This was a Dr. Ira Friedman, who was a one-time president of the American Jewish Historical Society. Now, you know that in the Western Hemisphere, blacks in Brazil number more than blacks in America. Mm -hmm. And this same historical society said that 75% of the Jews in the South own slaves, mm -hmm. while only 36% of the Gentile whites own slaves. Now, why are we saying this? What is this for? Yeah. Slavery caused the total destruction of an entire people. We lost our names, our language, our history, our culture, our God, and then were turned inside out because of slavery and the fact that we have black on black violence, black on black crime, and the murder of one another is directly related to self-hatred, which was instilled in us through slavery and the American institutions have reinforced it. At some point in time, everyone that had a part in our destruction must be called upon to have a part in our redemption. We can't, we can't let our African brothers off the hook. They helped to sell us into slavery. Hello. We can't let Arabs off the hook. They made a profit from slavery. We can't let Gentile Europeans off the hook, but neither can we let Jews off of the hook who held our fathers as slaves. Nor can we let the government of America off because the government of the United States of America has proved to be the worst enemy of black people. So now, so now when it comes time for justice, this is not spoken out of hatred or out of bitterness, but reparations have to be given to black people even as Jews receive reparations from the onslaught of Nazi Germany. And now the Japanese are going to receive reparations for what America did by putting them in concentration camps. What's wrong with the children of slaves we are here poor, ragged, hungry, naked, and out of doors. Reparations is what we want, and everyone that had a part in our destruction will have a part in paying reparations. I'll be right back with more Louis Farrakhan. Everybody talks about how you beat up on the white man, but you beat up on us more than you beat up on anybody. You know, you put us in check as often as you possibly can and tell us when we're acting like animals. And people love those quotes. Um, what do we do about black on black crime? To rebuke a person, to admonish or to correct a person does not mean hate. When someone will correct you, that is the greatest sign of their love for you. The scripture says, he whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth much. These are our, our people. We cannot escape being identified with our own people. No matter how high you rise in the entertainment field, you cannot escape being identified with the least little brother in the hood. Michael Jackson is the greatest pop artist that the world has ever seen, and he is the most popular human being in the world. But Michael was treated like a slave on a plantation because of a charge that has yet to lead to a criminal charge. But here's a human being that had to be made to strip forced in a judge's search order that if he didn't strip, they had the right to be violent with him and force him to reveal his nakedness that they may take pictures of him in that manner. 
That to me says that no matter how big Michael is, to those who look at us with our money, with our Mercedes Benz, with our fine homes and our fine cars and our prominent positions in life, you're nothing but a nigger. And if you get out of your place, I will have to put you back in your place. Michael Jackson is an extremely wealthy man, but he's an extremely sensitive human being. And if you watch Michael, you can know that the essence of God is in that man. For if God's spirit was not in Michael, Michael could not touch the hearts of so many millions of people, black, brown, red, yellow, and white, all over the earth. That man has God in him. I can't argue whether he's guilty or not. I don't know that. But I know that the man is being mistreated. And I ask myself, why? Why would tabloid television pay thousands of dollars to people to come on television to say what they say about Michael? Why would they threaten you with the loss of your show? This is what they think, that we are slaves to wealth, to power, to position over principle. And some of us are. But I believe that Michael is becoming politically mature. And Michael wants to use his political maturity along with his wealth to aid his people. And because there are those in high places that may fear the direction that Michael is going, let's strip him of his wealth, strip him of his fame, make him an outcast, then throw him in the laps of his people again. And so, my brother, uh, I appeal to all of our people, don't be afraid. Challenge your fear and stand up like men and women. For it is not white people that are your worst enemies. It is ignorance and the fear of what they will do that is our worst enemy. So when you challenge fear, as Arsenio has done tonight, he has earned even the respect of those who disagreed with him because he's not just an entertainer. He's a man. He's a man with principle. I just want you to get back uh, in this remaining time to our people and how we treat each other. We are the victims of ignorance and an oppressive system. There are more drugs in the black community today than ever before. And there are more guns in the black community than ever before. There was a time when black folk could not get a gun. But now black folk have guns, but not guns to shoot those who have destroyed us but guns to destroy each other. Our work is to teach black people to love themselves. And you can't love what you don't know. So in Black History Month, all black people and all white people should get to know who we are. And when you know yourself, you fall in love with yourself. And when you fall in love with yourself, it'll be exceedingly difficult for any of us to do harm to ourselves. If we don't respect ourselves, who then will respect us? And if we don't love one another, who then can we expect to love us? So the burden is not on white people to change toward us. The burden is on us to change toward ourselves. And when we do that, we will force a change in them. His name is Louis Farrakhan. Mr. Farrakhan, our whole country has been moving toward integration, equal rights. Uh, you don't want integration. You want separate schools and, if possible, a separate territory in this country or in Africa. Separation is not the main goal. That is the goal. If we cannot get along in peace, then we have to separate. Like two married people who have tried to live together and have irreconcilable differences. They go before a judge and there's a settlement. 
and there's alimony. And you want reparations like alimony? Yes. To every African American? You want money paid to every African American? Why should not America do something to repair the damage that has been done to black people for over 400 years of oppression? By giving everyone money? Not money. A fool and his money will soon part. If you gave our people with their mentality today $20,000, $40,000, $100,000, it would go right back out of our community tomorrow. But if we are allowed land and money, a way to become economically self-sufficient, to do for ourselves, to build homes, to build factories, then we would say America is beginning to repair the damage. You have had great success with many of the Nation of Islam men as security guards uh, in your own projects and other projects, sometimes better than the police. And you are hoping that the federal and the state and the local governments will use taxpayers' money to hire your people at various projects. And then um, your prophet and mentor, Elijah Muhammad, said, and I have the quote, the white man is so wicked and filthy that God calls him the skunk of the planet Earth. How do you expect taxpayers' money, that's all Americans, white and black, to want to fund the nation of Islam when there is language like that? The language is harsh. But the reality of black existence and black suffering is also very harsh harsh you call it, other people would call it vile. Do you stand by that language? The harsh language was designed to knock on your door and get your attention. It did. And that we did. The man whose that harsh language attracted attention to the nation of Islam most recently was Khalid Abdul Muhammad, then the nation's official spokesman and one of Louis Farrakhan's most trusted aides. In a speech at King College in New Jersey last November, Khalid proudly proclaimed he was an anti-Semite and called Jews bloodsuckers. When the speech attracted criticism, Farrakhan demoted Khalid. He said Khalid had used mean-spirited language, but had also spoken some truths. I would like to go through some of the things that he said and have you tell me, if you will, where are the truths and which are the truths that you still stand by. Jews are sucking the blood of the blacks. Jewelry is really Jew-elry, because Jews have been stealing all over the face of the planet Earth. That's why they're called Goldstein or Silverstein. No matter who sits in the seat at the White House, Jews control that seat. Jews control the media, especially NBC, ABC, and CBS. By the way, out of the five networks, including CEN, CNN and Fox, only one CEO is Jewish. Final. The Pope is a no-good cracker. Somebody needs to raise that dress up and see what's really under there. Which are the truth? While I rebuked the vile manner of his speech, I said I stand by those truths that he spoke. I stand by the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, if we are specific here, I cannot answer about jewelry or the name Goldstein or Rubenstein. Those Khalid Abdul Muhammad would have to answer. But if he calls Jews bloodsuckers of the black community, if we're going to be honest, in the 60s, many Jews were the merchants, they were the landlords, they were the furniture persons that we bought furniture from, they were the clothiers that we bought clothing from, and they grew in strength from our trade with them. Today, it's the Arabs and the Koreans and others. So sucking the blood means taking from the life of a community that it sustains your life. Many Koreans came to this country out of their own kind of slavery uh, with very little money and managed to take over working day and night and opening but these stores. But how did they do so that, Miss Walters? Their culture and their cohesiveness 
allowed them to pool their resources. Fine, but in putting down, I mean, you are trying to raise the culture and the initiative of the African Americans, and it's there to be raised. But is the way to raise it calling those who had raised themselves, whether they were Jews, Koreans, Arabs, well, bloodsuckers? That is not my language. So but you stood again, by that truth. I mean, this uh, is what uh, one uh, has to clear up. Uh, Ms. Walters, I stood, I told you what truths that I stood by. Okay, but do you stand let by that? Us, we are dying. Others are growing to strength. Now, if you ask, what is a bloodsucker? A bloodsucker is a leech. And when you put a leech on your skin, that leech sucks blood from you in order to maintain its own life. After all, Miss Walters, we have fought, bled, and died in every theater of war that this country has had for a freedom that we yet don't enjoy. But whites can say, and Irish and Scots and Jews and Italians, that they have also fought and died in wars. What I am asking and what people are asking, and I can go on with other questions, is how does it help your people to denigrate others? It does not help us to denigrate people. But you know, Miss Walters, as well as I, when you exploit the ignorance of a people, that is not somebody lifting themselves up. That's somebody lifting themselves up at the expense of somebody else. It means that something is wrong and very wrong. This book is one of the tools the nation uses to point out what it sees as wrong. It details what the Nation of Islam's research department describes as a secret relationship between blacks and Jews, claiming that Jews were large-scale slave owners. It is said to be based on Jewish writings. But scholars have criticized the book as inaccurate and distorted. The statistics that you give can be rebuked and refuted by Jewish scholars. But I'd like to go beyond you and me arguing about how many Jews there were as slaveholders. That was over 100 years ago. We now have relations with Germany. We don't hold what happened in Hitler's Germany against the young Germans. Why now are the sins of the fathers being visited upon the sons? Miss Walters, you have relationships with Germany today because Germany has moved to right a terrible wrong. Why pick on the Jews particularly, which is what you've done? I have not picked on the Jews in particular. You know, this idea of a victim. No, no, no. It's not the secret history of blacks and whites or blacks and Scots or blacks and Italians. It's blacks and Jews. And the reason for that, Miss Walters, is because... We all know that Gentile whites had some part in it. But there are many Jews who do not know the role that some Jews played in the slave trade. And it was a prominent role. But whether it was marginal or prominent, the fact of the matter is Jews have succeeded in the world. Blacks are at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. But you know... Especially in our time, Jews have felt that they had a desire and an obligation to help blacks. We had the civil rights marches in which you had so many Jews who participated. And you had young Jewish men who were murdered, like Andrew Goodman and um, Michael, Schwerner. Michael Schwerner. The Jews who have felt that they were more allied with blacks and perhaps even other nationalities would feel hurt. Can you understand how they feel? Can you understand, Miss Walters, how we feel? Blacks were bitten by vicious dogs and beaten with clubs and cattle prodded and water hoses put on us. Two or three whites died. Many, many blacks died. Died for what? That we could drink water at a fountain and go to toilet? What was our sweat and our blood in all of these wars for? That we should die to go to a toilet? That we should die to have a cup of coffee? Can you understand 
hour, Kurt. I can never fully understand what your people went through. I can try as a human being, regardless of what my religion or race may be. I can try, you can try. What I'm telling you is this, that when I have to look at a movie and see a black person depicted as a buffoon. You don't anymore. That's changed. But the Society's image is there. Crying. When I've got to go to school and read a textbook about little black sample. It's changed. It's when no I've longer got there. to hear people calling me a burrhead nigger and making mockery of the thickness of my lips and the broadness of my nose. Only ignorant people do that. So if Brother Khaled is saying that which stings and, and hurts, then look at it and say that's terrible use of language. And then go back and look at the terrible use of language by your people. But this is the present he's saying this. This isn't 10 years ago or 20 when years ago. When our people are suffering, Miss Walters, in the present for okay. what was done in the past. Yes, there should be a change. We should become more civil in our language. But that rebuke and that stinging language of Brother Khaled is enough to make you say, my God, this is terrible. Is it enough to make you say that it is wrong and that you disown it as a but, truth? But I have said okay, that. Okay, I'd like. I think people would like to hear you, you see, say it now. I have said that, but I don't want my words to be used to create division. Khalid Muhammad is my brother. Khalid Muhammad is my son in the ministry, and Khalid Muhammad is a helper of mine. So I am trying to correct him, but not destroy him. And I will not do that so that others can say uh, Farrakhan condemned his brother and renounced him. I'm not in the renunciation, denunciation pattern. I'm in a redemptive pattern. Incredible stridency there. Coming up on the program, Louis Farrakhan on the assassination of Malcolm X. Did he play a role in his view of welfare and black fatherhood? Just wow. recently, in an open letter to you, published in Boston, five African-American ministers of different denominations asked this question. I will quote it. You wrote in Muhammad Speaks, the die is set and Malcolm shall not escape. Such a man as Malcolm is worthy of death. That's your quotation. These ministers ask, given that five members of the Newark Mosque were identified as Malcolm X's killers by one of the assassins, and that you were reportedly at the Newark Mosque at the day of the assassination, what responsibility do you bear for Malcolm X's death? That's the end of their quote. Dr. Betty Shabazz, the widow of Malcolm X, also believes you helped plot his death. So may I respectfully ask their question, what responsibility do you bear for his death? Do you approve of the fact that Malcolm X was murdered? Were you at all involved in that murder? I'll take your last question first. No, I was not in any way involved in his murder. I did say those words or write those words, but that's not the full statement. I said such a man as Malcolm is worthy of death. And were it not for Elijah Muhammad's faith in God, it would have been so. Elijah Muhammad told all of us as his followers to leave Malcolm alone and leave Malcolm to Allah. I was in Newark at that time, the time of his assassination. It was my turn to be rotated into Newark to handle the preaching or the teaching that day. And that is my reason for being in Newark. Betty Shabazz never said that Farrakhan was a plotter in the death of Malcolm. But she said that Farrakhan helped to create the atmosphere. And that I can agree with. And in defending the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, charge and counter charge, we created an atmosphere. But don't leave out the United States government. Don't leave out the FBI, who had worked for years to separate Malcolm from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad.
Now, the last part of your question, yes. do I approve? At that stage of my development, I was very angry with Malcolm for what Malcolm had done. I was hurt by his assassination. I can't say that I approved and I really didn't disapprove. I was numb. But today, looking back, Malcolm would be so much more valuable to us alive. The number one problem in this country today is crime and violence, especially among young African Americans. So you give specific solutions to the problems of crime, violence. Can you tell us what they are? Well, first, black people have been taught systematically to hate themselves. So our people have a hatred for self, which manifests itself in our disunity and our inclination to violence among self. We must teach our people the knowledge of self. Self-knowledge produces self-love. And I'm going around this nation talking to young black men, teaching them to love themselves and making them to pledge to do good by self and others, and thereby not needing a gun. There is a great breakdown of family in this country and illegitimate births. Do you have solutions? Yes. The family, however, was broken down because of slavery. The slave master fed us, clothed us, and sheltered us. So that mentality uh, obtains to this day. If we really want to be respected as men, then we must take up our own responsibility, not just making a baby, but fathering it, maintaining it, nurturing it. You're against welfare. Yes. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says welfare, spelled backwards, means farewell to independent and creative thinking. So as fast as we can, we move our people away from welfare. In an interview in the Washington Times in 1990, you said, the crack epidemic did not start until after Louis Farrakhan became the voice of the poor. And about guns, you said, somebody is inspiring the black people to kill off each other. We believe it's the government of the United States of America. Do you really believe that crack and guns are being introduced into black neighborhoods by the United States government? And if so, do you have proof? Every black leader that we have had of substance, the government has been his or her opposer. The fact of the matter is that there was no crack prior to 1985 when Farrakhan spoke at Madison Square Garden in New York and nearly 50,000 people came out to hear him. The fact of the matter is that in the 60s, when blacks began moving in the civil rights movement, a purer form of heroin was introduced into the black community. That is a fact. So you think it might be the government? I believe with all my heart that there's a dirty hand here somewhere. And if the government is not responsible, then help me clean it up. What about AIDS, Minister Farrakhan? You've said the U.S. government is responsible for the spread of AIDS in Africa to decimate the African people. I don't think those were my exact words. Let me read them to you, and sure. let, let's clear it up, because I really want this to be correct. Yet, you said the spread of international AIDS was an attempt by the U.S. government to decimate the population of Central Africa. It came at the African-American summit in New Orleans in your speech in 1989. Do you know where the AIDS, where, where they say the AIDS virus was developed? Have I don't, you heard? I don't think anyone knows exactly where it came from. But right, I'd like right to ask Right outside you, of Washington. So it is your feeling that the U.S. government is deliberately spreading AIDS? It is my feeling. And finally, at the end of our dialogue, we asked Minister Farrakhan what he most wanted people to know about the nation of Islam. I would like the people to know that the nation of Islam was raised by God as a remedy 
for the ills not only of our people, but there's something of value that we have that can remedy the ills of this nation. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that he believed that a peace could be formed with the Jews and the blacks in America. I believe the same, and I believe it's time. Fascinating interview. Thank you, Barbara. Fascinating man. Brother Minister, Brother Minister, if you believe or if you agree with Reverend Lowry that somewhere along the way what we surrendered was the moral authority, how did that happen and how do we get it back? If you agree with that. The thing that came to my mind when you used the word contract and my brother used the word covenant, a contract or a covenant is between parties who intend to make their word their bond. I think it is proper and right that we make a covenant with our people. For the scripture says, woe to the shepherd who feeds himself and not the flock. Should not the shepherd feed the flock? The problem a lot of times is a disconnect between leaders and the people. Because most of the leaders, the scripture says, have been hirelings that flee when the wolf comes. But the good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. I would hope, and I know it can happen, that black intellectuals have been separated from the masses of our people. The masses of our people are going steadily downward because there's no connect between the learned of our people and the suffering masses of our people. There has to be a covenant made between those of us who have been blessed with knowledge blessed with wealth, blessed with opportunity to unite the best of our minds and the best of our pocketbooks to pool our resources to develop a programmatic thrust that will lift us and our people out of the condition that they're in. The last thing I want to say, no matter what covenant we make with each other, we have to be careful of any contract or covenant with those who don't have a word that they keep. Ask the Native Americans about all the treaties that they signed. Ask about 40 acres and a mule. We just celebrated 50 years of Brown versus the board of education, but while we were celebrating the victory, they were planning to put us right back under segregation, and here we are again. With voting rights bill and accommodation, public accommodation, that many suffered to give us that right. Here, Reverend Jackson earlier this morning said, in 2007, the voting rights bill could be turned out. So I'm leery about a covenant or a contract with a people who have no word. So I would advise taking the lead from what Reverend L and Reverend Lowry has said, let us make the right kind of covenant and it is a hypothesis that was put before us by God himself. In these words, if my people who are 
called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. That's the covenant. If y'all don't behave yourself, I ain't gonna get through this. <laughs> if y'all don't behave yourself, I can't get through this. <coughs> I, I, I know it's tough, ain't it? I know it's tough. But, but Brother Minister, I, 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 I'm just assuming, just guessing you probably got something you won't say. Having listened carefully to all of my wonderful brothers and sisters, I recognize that the thing that is missing is not the genius that is present or the genius that is absent, but the thing that is missing is the unity of us as a people. My beloved brother, Mr. Frazier, articulated some magnificent economic truths that can be realized fully by the unity of us as a people. My sister talked about education and health issues. We cannot any longer depend on a benevolent white person in office to look out for our needs. That responsibility is ours. Now, whether my brother, Bishop Eddie Long, can visit the White House and speak on behalf of us, or whether the Reverend Jackson can visit the White House and speak on behalf of us, or any of us, they, they, that they, they, they voice... Me, Mr. Farr, you haven't invited me. To oh, the well, <laughs> you're on your way, though, brother, for sure. <laughs> when you can assemble us like this, you are a very important man. <laughs> the few points that I want to make is based on what I heard. My sister with the union, she wants to be at the right table at the right time to talk about the right issues where workers are concerned. Everyone at this table, my dear sister, talked about policy and community. Reverend uh, Lowry and Reverend Sharpton brilliantly defined for us really the crux of the matter. Here's what I see. Respectfully. <laughs> Frederick Douglass said power concedes nothing without a demand. But power won't even concede to a demand if the demand is coming from a weak constituency that looks like they've lost their testicular fortitude. Baptist preacher too. <laughs> but listen family, listen. The generational gap is serious. But it's written of in scripture. When Moses gathered the people in the wilderness, he spied the promised land. 
but there were some giants in the promised land and the people were asked go in we with you they said wait a minute God <laughs> we would go but the giants are there they had no faith that they could take the land from the giants so what did God say okay you wander in the wilderness till you die out and I will take your children and they will inhabit the promised land Martin Luther King said I've been to the mountaintop I have seen the promised land I may not get there with you but we as a people will get there when we separate from a pharaohic idea of mental slavery our children listen our children cannot eat at the table of illusion and hypocrisy most of us who have access who have wealth who have quote unquote positions we are like mannequins in the shopping mall of democracy when you go to the shopping mall you see the mannequin the mannequin the mannequin is dressed in what you would like to buy the mannequin can't talk the mannequin can't walk we got black people in power but they don't have power we got black people with money we have black people with money that we think are giants but in the company of their white counterparts they are midgets now if we want to get where we want to go we can't focus on the house that has rejected us and our fathers for 400 years we have to now focus on ourselves now follow this and I'm out of here I mean I'm, I'm complete. follow this President Bush bless his heart is worried about weapons of mass destruction no dark nation should have a weapon of mass destruction they have a fear France got it England got it I think Germany may have something South Africa has it Israel has it these are the former some of them the former colonial masters they have the right to have it but don't give it to a darker power we're worried about China has it India has it Lord have mercy <laughs> Pakistan got it Korea was the axis of evil now Korea said well we got it all of a sudden they fell off the screen it's now Iran and Iraq well if they are so afraid of weapons of mass destruction my teacher the honorable Elijah Muhammad said our unity is more powerful than an atomic or hydrogen bomb that's the one thing we have never tried we kneeled in crawled in prayed in lied in slept in but still we are out if you want to get what you want we gotta start with a contract with us a contract a covenant with us we in leadership make a covenant with your people that you will never sell them out we as leaders listen leaders.
so-called must make a covenant with our people that nothing is more important than the salvation of a people who are now on a death march while we're singing and dancing and popping our finger and shaking our backside to the world we are on a death march into ovens but not the same oven called Auschwitz but it is a destruction coming to our people through bad health care no health insurance HIV AIDS drive-by shootings gang conflict crack cocaine we are now become the enemy of ourselves so we have to make a covenant and in closing conclusion oh yes I'm a Baptist preacher now in my conclusion in the 37th chapter of Ezekiel there was some dry bones that were in a valley and the bones were talking to one another they were having a conversation about a contract As they were having this contract, some of the bones said, our hope is lost. Our bones are dried. We are cut off from our part. There's some that are watching by television and some in this audience that think that we will never come together. That we will never make the right covenant or contract. I say to you, go back and read your scripture. Because when the Son of Man was set down in that valley that was full of bones, he spoke to those bones and the bones shook and the bones rattled. But they never stood up. So he went back to his sin and he said, Lord, I have spoken to the bones. And nobody has spoken to the bones like black leaders and black preachers. Nobody speaks to the bones like a Reverend Jackson or a T.D. Jakes or Bishop uh, Long or Bishop Patterson or Cornell West and those of us that preach Reverend Sharpton. The bones always listen. The bones shake. The bones rattle. But they never get up and they never do what they're supposed to do so one generation dies and another generation is born and we continue to run the same game so the son of man went back to his sin and said i've been talking the bones been shaken but there's still no life in them he said well don't talk to the bones no more prophesy to the winds and let the winds blow on these bones See, Bush is a wind. Your rejection at the table is a wind. My brother's going to dinner in the White House and can't come away with what is in the best interest of all our people. Jesse running twice, but still couldn't come away with what our people need. All of this is a farce. If, if we don't make up our minds, today to make this contract this covenant today not with us and the democratic party to hell with the democrats and to hell with the come as a unified body let's gather to Tavis the scholars we got them in theology to plan the moral and spiritual development of a people Bishop Long is not the pastor of this church alone T.D. Jakes is not the pastor of his church alone Reverend Jackson and Reverend Sharpton and Reverend Lowry are not the pastors of their constituencies alone 
These are the shepherds of an entire people. So what we shepherds, listen, listen. What we shepherds have got to do is come in a room to hell with the camera. Turn the camera off. Put the Bible on the table. That book, that book will transform human life if you teach it right. Stop entertaining your people with religion and start teaching your people and they will respond and they will be a better people. Listen, listen, let's gather our educators and sit in a room and plan the educational development of our people beyond the contrived education of the Western educational system. Dewey and Kant, who are the philosophers of Western education, were racist at the core. They deny you equal education because if you ever get equal education, they can't rule you anymore. They are not going to give it to you. You got to be willing to give it to yourself. Cornel West and Naeem Akbar and all our great educators, we didn't get what is making us through what we read in no school book. We got it from extracurricular activities, from teachers that gave us a bibliography that they don't recognize. We got to do the same for our people. We got to gather our health professionals. Sister talked about education. Well, tell me this. You going to depend on the undependable? to educate us about health issues when keeping us and the American people sick benefits the pharmaceutical industry? Come on now. You are sick and you're dying. Even though you're learning better how to eat, your mouth is in the kitchen of your former slave masters. How then can you be free going to the supermarket and you didn't produce nothing that's on the shelf. If we don't farm, which is the engine of any national life, farming, you ran away from the South, running from farms. Now the enemy got the farms and we got nothing, so we're dependent on somebody else to feed us, clothe us, and shelter us. That's why we're in a terrible health condition. Our ignorance is killing us. Our pastors need to be taught. Go back into the scriptures and teach our people how to eat, to live. Our radio stations, our television stations can't pander to the base human instinct where we become listeners to a degenerate culture pervade on radio and television and records. Jesus said, as a man thinketh, so is he. Well, as a man feeds your mind, you can't be no more than what you eat mentally. So if we allow BET not to be the purveyor of health to our people, rather than just music and dance and funk, you have to understand we're being destroyed, not because we're black, we're being destroyed because we're ignorant. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. All of us can go where we want to go. But Tavis, I'm with you to make a covenant, not with them, but a covenant with us. And if we gather the scholars and put them in a room, Let's come up with a 10-year spiritual plan, a 10-year moral development plan, a 10-year educational plan, a 10-year economic plan to gather that three quarters of a trillion dollars and put it to use to evolve and develop us. It's all in our hands. That's what he meant when he said, God ain't going to give you no more because God has given you everything.
everything you need, but you're not using what you've got. Thank you for listening. I, I sort of feel... I, I sort of feel like the... Um, I, I, I sort of feel like the Disney character, and, and I, I really want to just say, that's all, folks. I don't... I uh, want to spend the balance of this show playing devil's advocate, if you will, and give you a, trans, uh, give you a chance, that is, to address uh, some of the issues that so many have, speaking of issues, with the whole notion of slavery reparations. Let me just walk down a list of them and get your responses. Uh, this is perhaps not first on the list, but it's high up on the list. And that is, we hear, we hear white Americans say, I didn't own any slaves. I wasn't a slave master. I didn't have any slaves as chattel or as property. Why should I, in the 21st century, be asked, to pay reparation. Well, it's very true that the present generation of whites had nothing to do with our enslavement. But the fact of the matter is that black people as a people have been set at naught by slavery and by the government of the United States of America complicit in slavery from the very beginning. And since black people have been set at naught and robbed completely of the knowledge of themselves, their names, their language, culture, religion, God, and history, then it seems to me that it is only right that the government of the United States and the people of the United States accept responsibility, even if they did not do it themselves. You know, uh, O.J. Simpson was found innocent of murder, but found guilty because he said, was said to be responsible. The whites of today are responsible for the condition that has been handed down on us and the favor that has been handed down to them. And until and unless America faces up to the evil of slavery and what it has done to put black people in America in the condition that we're in, then race relations in America can never, ever get better and the wounds will never heal. There are those who point to people like Oprah Winfrey and Michael Jordan and Bill Cosby and not just names of persons that we all know. Indeed, most of those black folk are richer than most white folk I know, but they point to even people uh, like myself, admittedly, who are part of the black middle class and say that black folk are doing better now than they've ever done before, and y'all don't need reparations. You're doing extremely well as a people, better than you've ever done before. You know, uh, Tavis, even though there is a larger middle-class uh, black community than ever before of so-called, and I say so-called, successful black people, we cannot judge the condition of an entire nation by a group of successful black people. You are successful, maybe I'm successful, others are successful, but we've got nearly 40 million people in America that are still suffering and falling further and further behind. And those that have done well have not pooled their resources to help the masses come out of the condition that the masses are in. So we don't want the middle class the successful ones, to be used as a mannequin in the store of democracy to sell to the masses of black people that we can achieve just like you have achieved when in reality the ignorance, the pervasive ignorance, and the racism that exists in America will allow a few to escape, but the masses are caught in the fisherman's net. Speaking of the masses, there are those who say, Minister Farrakhan, that it is because there are too many folk in black America, too many of the masses who, by their own doing, have found themselves socially, economically, politically disenfranchised. Nobody put a gun to black men's head and said more of y'all should go to jail than go to than go to college. Uh, no one put a gun to his sister's head. So many of them and said, have babies before you are wed. The point is that there are a lot of folk who point to the conditions of black America and say not slavery. Not slavery, but the condition that black folk are in today is a condition of their own making. And if y'all would right the ship, you would need a check for reparation. You know, that's a very wicked thought, uh, Tavis, because when you say condition, you're looking at an effect. 
But until you and others are able to look at the cause that produced this effect, how dare any white man say to us that there's a gun in our hands and we are the culprit that have produced the condition that we're in. Granted, we contribute to it, but there's a whole scenario, brother. That's what America needs to look at, the cause that produced this effect. And I would debate with anybody, when you sit down and look at the cause of black-on-black -black violence, the cause of the guns in the black neighborhood, the drugs in the black neighborhood, the guns in the black neighborhood, black organizations and black leaders set at naught by a counterintelligence program of the government of the United States. No, no, no. This government cannot escape culpability for the problems that exist. And until America is willing to face her own wicked hand in our condition, there will never be any peace and judgment will come down on this nation as it came down on Pharaoh and Egypt and as it came down on the wicked slave masters of the past. Let me continue playing devil's advocate. There are some folk, uh, I speak now, Brother Minister, of folk inside of black America, because as you well know, there is not a universal agreement inside of black America that reparations ought to be the agenda. Uh, there is no uniform definition of what reparations ought to be. So first, what do you say to folk who say, if we gave y'all a check, y'all wouldn't know what to do with it. You'd go out and use it to buy cars and uh, uh, to buy the kinds of items that you already have a record of spending money on anyway, and that the money wouldn't even be well spent if we gave y'all a check. You know, it's not about a check, Tavis. A fool and his money will soon part. The enemy can print money and give you money, but if he doesn't allow you to get the sense of how to use the power of a dollar to gain what you really need to repair the damage, then a check won't do. So to give black people money is not just the answer. That may be a part of the answer, but that will not repair the damage. You got a people that know nothing about themselves. You got a people that have been taught systematically to hate themselves and to love other than themselves. A check will not solve that problem. But it is teachers that have that kind of knowledge that in uh, impart that knowledge to our people that will help to heal that mental wound. But then if America realizes what she has done to us, and if she gave reparations to the Japanese and reparations to Italian Americans and German Americans and even Chinese Americans, what is wrong with the African American who has been set at naught? No, reparations is a right cry and it will take the face the mask of civility off of white people, and then you'll see them as they are. But this cry for justice is coming up and it will not go down. We'll force you to recognize the evil that your hands have done and what justice is that we deserve. How do you respond to folks as I continue here in Black History Month to raise these devil advocate questions? How do you respond to folks, Brother Minister, who say that the problem here is that black leaders, again, to my earlier uh, point, have not come together uh, you, uh, uniformly to say that we want reparations. Let me tell you what I mean by this, and give me 30 seconds to set this up. I had the occasion any number of times, as you know, to interview President Clinton when he was in the White House. One of those conversations, one of those interviews on national television came when I traveled with him to the continent of Africa. He went to a seven, eight nation uh, tour of Africa, you'll recall, during his presidency. I was with him on that trip. He did a live interview from Ghana, as I, no, South Africa, as a matter of fact. We talked to the president in South Africa. One of the questions I got a chance to ask him in advance of, uh, of his trip to Gorey Island was whether or not he, in fact, was going to apologize for slavery. You'll recall there was a lot of heat he was taking back then about whether or not he should uh, apologize for slavery once he landed on African soil, on the soil in the motherland. There were a lot of black leaders on that trip. Pretty much everybody who's anybody except you was on the plane with the president on Air Force One traveling to the continent of Africa. And one of the reasons it, it occurred to me as I, as, I, as I traveled with the president that he wasn't going to apologize for slavery is that all the black leaders in America who were traveling with him could not agree on whether or not he should apologize for slavery and whether or not reparations should then come after that. Half the Negroes on the plane were saying, Mr. President, it ain't your fault. You ain't got to apologize. The other half of the black leaders were saying, maybe you should apologize. 
And so the president, my point is he got cover and didn't have to apologize because black leaders could not come together on this question. So how do you respond to folk having said all of that who say to you that y'all can't come to the government or anybody else asking for something until y'all figure out what y'all really want to do? Well, you know, there's always been a hand-picked group that placate the feelings of the slave master and his children. I would imagine that just being on Air Force One was compensation for slavery for some of those quote unquote Negroes. But that won't work with me. And that won't work with tens of thousands, yea, millions of black people. Here's a new crop of leadership coming up. Randall Robinson is a man that has made it in America, a brilliant black man, an intelligent black man. He wrote a book called The Debt. He is of the middle class, but you couldn't get him on Air Force One to act in that silly manner. But those Negroes that spoke that, they won't be in leadership over our people in a few days. In South Africa, brother, before Nelson Mandela came out of prison, is these kinds of handkerchief head, knee bending, back scratching, head scratching, shuffling Negroes. Is these kind that they put tires around their neck with gasoline in it. Don't you be surprised at what will come up from the masses of black people in their anger and hurt over leadership that refuses to speak to the needs of our people. We're not asking for what we don't deserve. Now, some of these same Negroes will tell you that the Jews deserve payment, reparations for the Holocaust, 12 years of their suffering in Nazi Germany. Here we are 400 years in America suffering from one uh, since the first century of our presence to this very day. And you mean to tell me a black man can be a leader of black people and can't see the need to redress our grievance? Then those kind of leaders will be buried in the sand of ignominy in just a few days. Let me ask you how it is that you think this issue is ever going to get traction. Randall did, in fact, Randall Robinson, you referenced earlier, did, in fact, write a brilliant book about the debt and I think made the case as good as anybody can make for why America does, in fact, owe black America a debt, if, in fact, one believes that. Randall, I think, made the best case. But the question is this. John Conyers, Democratic uh, member of the House out of uh, Detroit, you know well, has for years now, almost a dozen years now, every single congressional session, he has introduced legislation, not for reparations, Brother Minister, as you know. Just to study the problem. There you go. Just to have a commission to study the problem. That, and it never has gotten out of commission. There, it won't, it was, it was, you, you know my question then. Exactly. How, how is this issue going to get traction and you can't get a commission established out of committee? That's why on February the 29th, my subject is, what does Europe and America owe and what does God promise? See, it's in America's hand right now. Can you imagine a president of the United States not even willing to say, we're sorry for what has been done to black people. But if you make any statement, Tavis, that could be considered slightly anti-Semitic, they'll be all over you in the morning asking you to apologize. And if you don't apologize for yourself, then stand up and apologize for Louis Farrakhan. But you mean to tell me these people that set us at naught can't stand up and say, I'm sorry, when the Pope of Rome has asked Africa and the indigenous people of this planet to forgive the Catholic Church for the evils that the Catholic Church has done to the indigenous. And America can't even start the process of atonement by offering us an apology. Hey, Tavis, after a while, it's not going to be in the hands of the Congress of the United States. It's in the hands of God 
and our problem is before his court. And that's why I know that the scriptures will be fulfilled. We'll get justice all right, if not from the hands of those who perpetrated the crime against us, we'll get justice from God himself. And when he gives it, I feel sorry for those who had a chance to do better and wouldn't even apologize and start the process. Let me ask you then, um, we, as I said earlier in this conversation, uh, everybody knows February is Black History Month, and so we celebrate the contributions of America, of contributions rather of African Americans to this place that we live in called America. Uh, it's not lost on me that in May of this year, as you well know, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education case, the case, the seminal case that declared unconstitutional, illegal, separate but equal uh, education in this country, and then everything else started to fall apart with regard to de- with regard to segregation. That is. Uh, the, the question, though, is this. If after all this time, on the eve of the 50th anniversary of that case, we still cannot, to your point, get a single American president to even apologize for slavery. Let, never mind the checks now. You can't even get an apology for slavery. What does that say to you in Black History Month 04 about the progress or lack thereof we've made in America around the issue of race relations? Well, Tavis. In all truth, the progress can be made if the effort is really sincere. Uh, The 1954 historic decision to outlaw separate but equal in education, if it were really sincere, integration would have been a reality in the education of the country by now. But it has reverted to just what it was. Why? Because as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, integration is a hypocritical trick to make the black man feel that his 400-year-old enemy has all of a sudden become our friend. If you can't get an apology, if you can't even get an elected official, many of whom got there from the vote, of black people to admit that a great wrong has been done to an entire people and that wrong has to be redressed. Otherwise, one of these presidents said, I fear for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. It's not gonna be in the hands of white people to do justice by us in a few days from now. And that's what happened to Pharaoh. The just thing was, let the people go. Don't play with their lives. You don't want us, let them go. But they didn't want to do that. So God stepped in and destroyed Pharaoh and his army. America right now is on her way down. You can see it if you look. All this dancing and music and partying, that's not blinding all the American people. It is as it was in the days of Noah. They were drinking, dancing, partying when the end came. And in the days of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, they were doing the same. And so it is today. You're partying, but your world is coming down. Justice or else face the wrath of a mighty God who will not ask no questions when the time of judgment has come. I've got just a couple of minutes here. Our time is uh, is never long enough to delve into all these issues. But let me ask you right quick, since you mentioned integration very quickly, whether or not you think that integration, many people 50 years after Brown v. Board, certainly on the education front, are starting to think that integration may have been not the best thing for black folk in the first place. Your thoughts on whether integration was a mistake? In the South, we had black motels, black hotels, black restaurants, black cleaners, black bus companies, black insurance companies, black this, black that. Now, the black man in America is woefully lacking in those industries, those businesses that give jobs to ourselves and keep our dollar within ourselves to improve our community. I think that integration, If it were sincere, people respecting each other, people trying to get along with each other. But 
acknowledging Rome. I have to give Germany credit because Germany acknowledged we did something wrong. The present generation of Germans did not put the Jewish people in those gas chambers and burn their flesh. But they know it was a former generation that did it, so the responsibility was on the present government of Germany to right the wrong. And they have given billions of dollars and also assistance technically and otherwise to Israel and to the Jewish people. We applaud that. That's right that they should do that. And it is right that America recognizes the contribution that we have made to make this country great. Our young men, along with young white men and brown men, are dying in Iraq over the misadventure of a president, in my judgment, who is guilty of criminal behavior. Yeah, but if we don't recognize truth and do justice on the basis of truth, we are all lost. Louis Farrakhan, one of our guests this morning. Good morning to all of you. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. And I'm Joan Lennon. It is Friday. It is October 20th. If Louis Farrakhan can fulfill his promise of getting out the vote, he will have increased his power dramatically. But can he? That is the question. The leader of the Nation of Islam has been in the news all this week, the result of the Million Man March on Monday, and he will join us exclusively this morning. There he is, standing by. Uh, he'll tell us about his political plans and about his suit demanding a recount of the number of people who attended his rally. Also this morning, we're going to get to a reaction from the Park Service in Washington to Good Morning America's own report yesterday that uh, contradicted the official estimate of how many attended the march. Right now, Spencer Christian standing by with a, a peak, mm -hmm, at least, yeah. at the weather. At least sitting by with a peak. Okay. Uh, we have changed. Margin of error in their estimate was 25%. That still means, at a minimum, an estimate 50% higher than the Park Service count of 400,000. The man responsible for the official count last Monday is Major James McLaughlin of the U.S. Park Police, and he's joining us this morning from Washington. Major, I appreciate you joining us. Do you stand by your estimate? Uh, we do stand by the 400,000 count. Yes, we do. The recount that we commissioned used as sophisticated equipment, as we understand now, exists, and it approximately doubled your estimate. Do you think that estimate was wrong? Well, not, I don't know if it was wrong. I don't know what technology they used. I know that you uh, went out and hired someone to do this, uh, and they came up with some figures that uh, we totally disagree with. And uh, we know what the square footage of the mall is, and we believe we know how many people can fit into that, and we stand by what we've uh, what we stated. I, I know that you can't get photos from exactly above because you don't want to fly a helicopter over a crowd that large. Right. But is there some other way? I mean, can you use, for instance, satellite photography? Well, if there's other ways out there, we're more than happy to look at it, and certainly we would like to get with Boston University and talk to them about it if they like. But I think you need to remember that we're a police department, and and our resources are limited. And uh, I know there was other issues about the angles and everything. Those angles don't affect us because from the angle that we take our photographs, we're looking for green grass in the mall. We're looking for area where those people are not. And uh, our angles are sufficient as far as I'm concerned. Quick final question. The accusation was made by organizers of the march that the underestimate was intentional, done for racial reasons. Your response to that? That's absolutely untrue and a ridiculous statement. All right, Major McLaughlin, I appreciate you joining us this morning. Thank you for being here. Whether the real number was 400,000 or 600,000, 800,000, a million, there's no doubt the Million Man March was a highly significant political and social event. What will its impact be in the short and long term? The view now from the man who called for the march, Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, who has now had a few days to contemplate what took place, and he's joining us this morning from Chicago. Minister Farrakhan, appreciate you joining us. Why are you so hung up on a number of how many people were there? Actually, it's history. Those poor black men who sacrificed their hard-earned dollars to be there on that mall came there for the express purpose of contributing their person to the making of history. And to rob them of the history that they made is tantamount to the same robbery that took place on our fathers when we were first brought but, to these shores. But it seems Dr. to... Dr. Farouk El-Baz and his estimation is a, a much better estimation than what the uh, Park Service did. However, it also 
falls short because of the inadequacy of the photos that they use. But it seems to me this, the history is in the spirit of what took place on Monday, not but necessarily my the number. And my grandchildren and our great grandchildren will not be able to see the spirit. That is a momentary thing. And that's why history should be accurate. It shouldn't be his story or our story, but the real story that should be told. And this is why we're going to court, because we have to put the truth out before the world. Well, writers who write about this it, This was though. the largest demonstration in the history of this nation, and we refuse to be robbed of that victory. But writers, it seems to me, who write about this, and already a lot has been written, will write about that spirit. That can be read. And if you look at it from the outside, some might say, look, the more the crowd, the more that uh, Minister Farrakhan is legitimized as a leader of African Americans, and that's why he wants the estimate to be larger. Did you know that there was an official memo from uh, one of the department heads in Washington that said that the metro rail and the metro bus had the second largest uh, amount of persons using that facility in 20 years, and they said 1.2 million persons use metro rail and metro bus. This does not even account for the huge number of buses, the airplanes that brought our people there. So we have to look at all of these facts to get the real truth of how many of us were actually there. You said in the wake of the march you wanted those who support you to get involved politically and that the loyalty would not be to party but to an agenda. But you didn't lay out the agenda, and I don't know what it is. What is it? Well, actually, uh, in the next month, Many of the African-American leaders will be meeting again in Washington, D.C. under the auspices of the National African-American Leadership Summit. And at that point, we will begin working on the agenda. And that agenda we will take in town meetings throughout this nation for our people to amend it or ratify it. And that will be the base upon which we make uh, our moves. Before the march on Monday, I, I went and looked at, at your publication, Final Call, and I saw a couple of issues. They both had the same, the same article on the inside back page, and I gather that's on the inside back page of every issue of the magazine, and it said, what Muslims want? And it says, we want our people to be allowed to establish a separate state or territory of their own, either on this continent or elsewhere. And it goes on to say, our former slave masters are obligated to maintain and supply our needs for the next 20 to 25 years. Is that part of the agenda? Well, actually, our first uh, want is freedom. Our second is justice. Our third is equality. And if we can get freedom, justice, and equality within the political and social sphere of this nation, then separation is not necessary. However, if freedom, justice, and equality cannot be found in this system of things, then separation is a methodology for solving the problem between the two races. However, when all of the black leaders sit together, male and female, to determine an agenda for our people, I don't think that separation will be a plank or a part of that at this point in time. Minister Farrakhan, when you lay out the kind of agenda that you just did, the first three points that you made, it seems to me that what you're saying is what you want is a better life, better conditions for the blacks, the African Americans in our society. But why, what is such a mystery to so many people is why in your rhetoric you use race baiting and, and religious threats. Doesn't that get in the way of what it is that you eventually want? The fact that we have been here for 440 years and are still looking for freedom, still seeking justice, still seeking equity, says that something and someone is blocking that effort. So if we point out those institutions that block our sincere desire for freedom, justice, and equality, and those persons and institutions that do that, that's not race baiting, that's pointing out the wrong that has to be corrected. We've had 
on this broadcast just in the last couple of months. It occurs to me as you speak, a couple of authors. Jeffrey Canada wrote a book called Fistic Knife Gun. Jonathan Kozel, who has written a book, a new book called Amazing Grace. And, and they lay out, I think, eloquently the plight of blacks in America and the failures of whites. And they do that without calling anyone bloodsuckers or without calling whites devils or any of that kind of thing. Are they wrong with that approach? I mean, do you have to do what you're, what you're doing? Oh, no. I, I wouldn't say that they are wrong, but I wouldn't say that we are wrong either. You know, to hold up the mirror of truth, for a nation to look into that mirror and see themselves as they look in the eyes of God, that standard or criterion represented by all the prophets doesn't make America or those of us in America look so good. And maybe we want to break the mirror, but the thing we ought to do is clean up our act, straighten up our lives, that we can be in the favor of God rather than in his disfavor. But words matter. And they matter when they drive divisions between parts of our society. And doesn't you? I'm very you... sorry. I'm very sorry, sir. But we and words have not driven divisions. We came here in the holds of ships and we were segregated on the plantations. And since we have been set free, black folk live in a certain part of town. 30 years ago, the Kerner Commission said we had two Americas, one white, one black, separate and unequal. And they revisited their findings and found it even worse today. Muslim ideology or words did not do that but it is the acts of government and institutions that have done that. And if, sir, over $1 trillion has been spent by the United States government since the Johnson administration to sort of fix things and they have not been fixed, please don't blame the divisiveness on Louis Farrakhan. You better look at yourself, look at your government, look at your institutions, look at your courts, and look at the injustice that prevails in this society. Mr. Farrakhan, Minister Farrakhan, on that point, we will leave it. Thank you for joining us. Minister Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just realized that a few days ago that C-SPAN featured you and I had an opportunity a few days ago to read about the wonderful work that you and your wonderful people have been doing in the cities of Chicago, Illinois and Washington, D.C. and I'm sure others around the country in helping to eradicate the drug problems and other problems that we have with our people. And may I say to you and all that support you and God, thank God for you. And I'm delighted that you're doing this. May, may I shake your hand again? Yes. <laughs> but you know what? The oddity of this all is I'm Christian. And I'm a Muslim. <laughs> Do you know what that means? No, but I believe in Jesus. Well, I believe in Jesus, too. I couldn't be a good Muslim unless I believed in Jesus. The word Muslim means one who believes in obeying God. A good Christian couldn't be a good Christian unless we obeyed God. So you see, <laughs> one faith, one Lord, one baptism. baptism. All right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but you may be Muslim. Uh, I'm black. Well, uh, Somewhere along the line, I'm there too. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it wonderful because we have something, a lot of things in common, don't we? More in common than we have not in common. I think that those who are out there drinking wine oftentimes have more sense than those who call themselves intelligent because the wino is not interested in the label the wino is interested in the content in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And so we may be divided by different labels, 
But if we look under the label and study the content, we all believe that there is but one God. We believe in truth. We believe in the hereafter. We believe in the resurrection of the dead and the judgment of the world. But most of all, we believe that this is the time for the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden to be liberated and uplifted. And since black people in America are the most downtrodden, the rejected, and the despised, we believe it's our time to come from the bottom, by God's grace, oh, yeah. to be lifted to the top. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, yes. And obviously, I believe the same. I wanted you to come and share with us because I knew you believed in those principles. And I think that we often let pettiness divide us. We can't afford to be divided as a people because we have to do our work that, that we were put here to do together as human beings. And what is so little about the division isn't even important in God's eyesight. As long as we live clean lives and we're humble and we obey the rules of God, then we can see his face. Then and only then. I agree. <laughs> so, so you see, brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to let anyone divide us, make us dislike, distrust, hate each other, when by nature we are born of God. And since we are born of God, then this man and I, though from a different mother's womb, we are brothers. We are family, and we ought to start acting like a family. As Jesus said, you must learn to love your neighbor as who? As yourself. But if you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. And how can you love yourself if you don't know yourself? And in this world, they have deprived us of the knowledge of ourselves, therefore, we are the number one beaters, shooters, haters, rapers, destroyers of one another. So we've got to practice that love that Jesus taught, and we've got to start first with self. Yeah. I love you, brother. I love you, brother. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought, what an example we can be to our people. I'm Christian, you Muslim. We're both black. We both have the same concerns. What a wonderful example to the rest of this world to see that we can love one another and yet we can continue the work that we must do together. So I wanted to use Bobby Jones' gospel as a platform to bring love to the world. Uh, that's what I'm all about. That's what Christians are all about. How could I deny an intelligent man as you that have so much information for us and opportunity and give us the opportunity to hear what you have to say? Minister Farrakhan, we truly, truly love you. And thank you for taking the time, the time from your busy schedule to come to say hello to us. Bobby, thank you. I think that Bobby is very unique in that Bobby would give me, a Muslim, a chance to express myself uninhibited, not a 30-second bite on television where your message is distorted and corrupted by those who do not wish my own people to understand me or my message. So I would say to all of our brothers and sisters who are listening, if you wanted to know about Jesus, you wouldn't go to Pontius Pilate and you wouldn't go to Herod and you would dare not go to Caesar. But if you wanted to know Jesus, you would have to meet Peter, Thomas, John, James or Andrew, one of the disciples or meet the master himself or meet one of those who was touched by the power of his word. And I say that to say this. If you really want to know who I am, right. you got to meet me for yourself, not through those who hate me because Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And if we are not free, then that means that there's a particular truth that we have not yet learned, and the enemy knows that God has blessed me to know that truth, 
and therefore they want to put a veil over me so that I would never be able to teach you what God has given me that would free us indeed that we may get on with the business of liberation of ourselves and the whole human family of our earth. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, you know what? I heard through the grapevine, you know what that grapevine is all about, that you are an accomplished musician, that you played an instrument on television on the Ted Mac Amateur Hour at the age of 14, and you have not played this instrument on television in a long time. Is this true? That's about right. About 40 some years I have not been on television with my instrument. And it's been almost uh, 20 years uh, since I have literally played it. And every now and then when I feel a little depressed, I will pick it up and begin to play. And so I wanted to honor a request made by Bobby that I play for you, but I wanted you to hear me play my instrument without having practiced to let you know that what you give up for God, you never lose. Ah, oh, wonderful. Well, I'm going to uh, ask your son, Mr. Farkhan, if he would come and bring this instrument the wonderful violin. And you be very careful with this instrument. Let's welcome Mr. Farrakhan, please. <laughs> Hello. Delighted to see you also. All right. Thank you very much. And, and uh, what are you going to play for us? I would like to play, without the benefit of an accompanist at this point, a cappella, if you will, Meditation from the Opera Thais by Mazenet. Since this is a gospel program and meditation is a part of all religious worship, I would like, as I play this instrument, for you to meditate on the power of God to deliver when you don't think you can be delivered. This is an instrument that I do not play. I work 18 to 21 hours a day for the liberation of our people. But as I meditate on my God, who gave me the gift and did not take it from me, you meditate on the power of God who has given every one of you in this television audience and every one of you that are looking by television your own special gift. And if you meditate on God, he will help you to develop your gift that you in your way and I in mine and Bobby in his may glorify the creator, the giver of all gifts. Ladies and gentlemen, Minister Lewis Farquhar.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know that was one wonderful applause for welcoming us back, but I want you to do another one because I'm going to say to you again, would you welcome again Minister Louis Farton? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, those of us that read our holy books realize that they are fulfilling themselves because what's happening all around us is certainly a fulfillment of God's word. He's coming back again, and we think it won't be long. The destruction that's happening around us and all of the many concerns that most people are concerned about in our communities today, one problem especially that's destroying many people, young people in our community. There are a lot of them, but one in particular, the drug problem. And I think it would be remiss if this program did not address this problem, especially since so many of you that are imprisoned today, not just behind the prison walls, but in your homes, in your communities, wherever you are. We need to discuss this problem and we need to see what we can do as responsible human beings to give some message to those of us that may be hooked on it. And Minister Farrakhan has done a wonderful job in this particular area. Share some of that with me, please, sir. Well, you know, brothers and sisters, I used to think that drugs had no natural need in the human spirit. I used to think that maybe just air, food, and water was what we really needed. But as I began to study the drug problem and why drugs are so pervasive in the world today, America's economy is approximately $3 trillion. Russia is second with one trillion seven hundred billion dollars and the worldwide drug market legal and illegal is one point six trillion dollars so drugs is also a superpower that is corrupting nations presidents rulers police you name it drugs are corrupting the people but it's not so much the drug, but there is an inordinate demand on the part of the people for the drug. If there were no appetite, there would be no need. So what is it that produces the appetite for drugs? You know, whenever there's a traumatic experience in our lives, there's a natural secretion that the brain gives to keep us quiet to help us get through a storm in our lives. Whenever there's a need for inordinate strength, the brain secretes powerful hormones that give you adrenaline, that give you the strength to jump over a fence or to run extraordinarily fast or to do something that demands extraordinary strength. But what happens when your natural ability to provide what the body needs for natural circumstances of life is depleted because the circumstances of life are so overwhelming that you have nothing within yourself to combat it, neither in knowledge nor in faith nor in substance. So then you reach outside of yourself and the drug man is there with the reefer, with the cocaine. And many of you who are not on cocaine, who are not on reefer, who are not on heroin, you have to go to bed with a pill and wake up with a pill, but you are all on some kind of drug. But why is this? Jesus said it like this. Know that in the last days, there will be wars and rumors of wars and kingdom shall rise against kingdom and nation against nation. There will be pestilence and famine and earthquake in diverse places, but these are just the beginning of sorrows. What next? Brother shall deliver up brother. There'll be betrayals. Paul said in that day there'll be 
Men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They will be heady, high-minded, traitors with unnatural affection. There will be hatred, you see, among us as a family. So now there's nothing in the head to combat this. So the drug man comes in because the world is under judgment. And the only way you can get through it is you got to have a faith in God stronger than the need for the drug. And so I say to you, there is no solution to this problem outside of faith in God. And when you truly believe in God and put your trust in God, then he gives you the mental power to go through the trauma of the times. Why, you could have a, a drug seller all outside of Muhammad's mosques and they would go broke because inside we have no need for that. Our appetite is not there for drugs. Our appetite is filled with the wisdom of God and faith in God. And I say that America has to turn back to God in true faith and submission to God. Otherwise, America, like ancient Rome, Babylon, Sodom and Gomorrah, and ancient Egypt, will be the twisted wreckage of another great nation that could have lived out her greatness, but she was corrupt and rotten from within because she lost faith in God. What is the future of our people? Does anyone really care? And this is why I am so happy to be here tonight as the guest of Our Voices with Sister Beverly that we might talk about a solution to these many, many problems. Won't you keep tuned? Good evening, I'm Bev Smith. Along with Hilton Felton, our piano man, we welcome you to a very special conversation with a very special man, the Honorable Minister of the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan. We greet you by saying, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, my sister. You said, who really cares? Let us deal for a moment with African Americans. Do we care about ourselves in 1990? I think that there are many, many of our people who do care, Beverly, but we don't know how to make our caring substantive for our own relief. We have many leaders that articulate the problem, but we are not working collectively to bring about a solution to the worsening crisis of our people. I think a lot of our people care, but we just lack the guidance and the program to bring about the redress of our grievances. We will spend a great deal of time this evening talking about the program, but you also mentioned the guidance. Let's look to that for a moment. Have we ever, as we have been in this country as African of African descent had guidance? And if so, in your opinion, where did the guidance come from? From the time that we were on the plantations, God gave us a natural sense of guidance. Even though the slave masters never allowed our mothers and fathers to learn to read or write, but there's something about the nature of the human being when we saw the change of seasons, the night pass into day and the day pass into night, our mothers and fathers knew that a change would come. And so many of our slave parents couldn't talk to us straight out, so they put little hints in spirituals. So we got a spiritual like deep river. My home is over Jordan. I want to cross over into campground. Oh, don't you want to go where? To that promised land where all is peace. Let's steal away. We can't walk away. We can't run away. Let's steal away home. Sending a message. Sending a message. As we look at, and as I said, we're going to spend a lot of time hearing what you have to say. As we look at the African-American community, 
who sends a message today? Because whoever it is, are they sending the message loud enough? You know, God has so wonderfully blessed us with many men and women to send us messages. So many, like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, uh, Noble Drew Ali, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. But every time, Sister Beverly, we got somebody to give us a message that would amend the condition that 400 years of slavery imposed upon us, those in power fearing that message and the messenger and our possible unity around that message did something to that message and that messenger. And this is why, Sister Beverly, we have never had any continuity of struggle. We always seem to be going back over the same ground again. We're talking about the message being stopped and the messenger. He also mentioned fear. Time for a break. When we come back, what is this fear the white man has for the African-American? And what is the message? And are we hearing it today? And also, we want you to get involved when you dial 1-800-344-BETV, 1-800-344-BETV. If you are in Virginia, Maryland, in the District of Columbia, area code 202-636-2060. That's 202-636-2060. Now, when we come back, We'll pick up on why they fear us, and we'll let you talk to the Honorable Minister of the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan. The state of African, Africans who are here in America, that's our topic tonight with the Honorable Minister from the Nation of Islam, Minister Louis Farrakhan. Let's take the gloves off and get right to it. You mentioned fear. What is there to fear? Why are whites afraid of us? Whenever you've done wrong, and you've deceived the person, there's always a fear of being discovered and uncovered. Whenever you have oppressed a people, you're always afraid that one day the oppressed will rise and become the oppressor. So here we are, black people in America, increasing in very large numbers. And according to the scriptures, Pharaoh feared the multiplication of the children of Israel. And his words were, come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, join on to an enemy of ours, and remember our evil done to them and come against us. White people put their mind on us. They don't see us as a forgiving and loving people. They can only judge us by what they know they would do if this were done to them by us. But the interesting thing about African Americans is that we have never at any time demonstrated the kind of anger toward them that they are fearful of. If we can be accused of anything, then the accusation should be that we demonstrate our anger against each other. I should be the fearful one. Black on black crime is at an all time high. What the heck are they afraid of? Again, they don't mind black on black crime because as long as we are attacking each other, they, they feel safe. When we come into order and peace and discipline and love and unity, then they become intensely afraid because that guilt comes right back up. They feel it is owed to them, and therefore, why shouldn't we punish them as they punished us? You use the term owed to them. Recently, I've been reading a lot about you because you have made some statements about what you think is owed to us as a result of what you call our Holocaust in America. What is owed to us? You know, it's very interesting when we talk about a black holocaust and we try to get black people to remember what has happened to us that's called hatred when jewish persons keep talking about what hitler did to them that's called remembering so it will never happen again 
Many of our scholars estimate that in the middle passage from Africa to America, we lost in the neighborhood of 100 million black lives. The soil of America is soaked with the blood of our fathers. So when we start talking about what is owed to us, we have to consider the 100 million lives that were lost in the Middle Passage. We have to consider 300 years of chattel slavery. We have to consider the damage that was done to our psyche, to our minds, by taking away from us our names, our language, our culture, our religion, our God. And as you mentioned, uh, Sister Beverly, you and I should be the ones fearful because of the black on black crime. But we were systematically taught in this society to hate the blackness of our skin, to hate our African origin, to think of ourselves as nothing. So as Jesus said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if I think I'm nothing and I hate myself and my origin, then when I look at you, I see an extension of myself. Therefore, I'm bitter towards you and I strike out towards you. But all these years, we have been taught just the opposite about white people. We've been taught to love them, to forgive them. We've been given an image of our savior, Jesus Christ, And that image is white, although the description of Jesus in the Bible is quite the contrary. So we have been taught all our lives to look up to white, to idolize white, even to worship white. And so when they did that recent um, story on television where they asked a young black child to pick up uh, the doll doll that they would admire, she picked up the The white white doll. doll. It is because we have been made to be and to love other than ourselves and to hate ourselves. All of this is a part of our Holocaust. And when Abraham Lincoln let us go, and I put that in quotes, and the 13th Amendment struck down involuntary slavery the way our minds had been fixed. We couldn't do anything but go right back we to the same slave. slave master and volunteer to be a slave. But this is 1990, before we go to the phones, Minister Farrakhan. In the 60s, in the 70s, we had what could be called a revolution of sorts. In the 50s, we had the writings of Malcolm X. We had the emergence of the Honorable Minister Elijah Muhammad, who you followed. We had Dr. Martin Luther King. We had Stokely Carmichael yelling, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. We had organizations like the Urban League funding grants in communities to work on projects for self-esteem. You mean in 1990, we don't feel good about who we are? Why not? Because, uh, Sister Beverly, when Dr. King was assassinated and a hundred cities went up in smoke. Uh, White folk began to study us and they studied why we acted on one accord without any leader, no conspiracy. What brought this about? And they found that it was television. It was black programming, pardon me. It was like black journal. Black on Black, all of these black programs sold were on television. And if you notice, since the late 60s and early 70s, every one of these black programs have been taken off the air and the language has changed. We are no longer black and Hispanic. We are the minority, the underclass. You see, so we are relegated now to an inferior numerical status and underclass. And these are cold words to keep us from using the term black, which we rallied around in the 60s. You're saying then it is deliberate. But then if it is deliberate and there are those among us who are wise enough to see the signs, why isn't there some attempt? I mean, it isn't as if we don't know what the enemy is all about. We have studied the enemy, some of us, from our breast as we suckle them. So why is it we are buying in to the plan? You know, some of our leaders who, after the civil rights 
bill of 64 and 65 and the voting rights bill of, uh, I think it's 66 or 67, many of our black intellectuals were so happy that we could go into places among white people that we never went before. We didn't pay attention to the critical era of writing our history. And so right while we were looking, Dr. King was distilled to one sentence, I have a dream. Malcolm X was distilled to one phrase, by any means necessary. And our history was being reversed and now children are growing up in high schools in America feeling that we don't have anything to struggle for. We have already attained the promised land. Again, don't forget the counterintelligence program of J. Edgar Hoover, where that man and the government of the United States purposely set out to undermine, discredit, destroy black leaders, black organizations, and put us one against the other. And so in the 60s and 70s, we've seen the destruction of all of our black organizations, all of our black leaders. And unfortunately today, we only have two remaining national voices for the hurt of our people. One is Jesse Jackson and the other is Louis Farrakhan. Let's take a call. Good evening. Thank you for being out there. You're on our voices. I need your first name and where you're calling from. Yes, Beth. This is Ferris calling from Maywood, Illinois. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And I have a question for the minister. I'd like to know, uh, with all the atrocities that have plagued black folks, uh, black men and women throughout the uh, centuries, can he see any signs of retribution, not by the hands of blacks toward uh, mankind, but... Uh, even by with nature, is, is there any forms of retribution that you can see in the near future that we can live to see? You're living in it, my dear brother, right now. God is not unjust. Even though one uh, white president said um, uh, he trembled for his country when he reflected that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our illustrious leader and teacher, taught us that whenever a nation's evil outweighed its good, there are forces in the universe itself that will remove that nation, that government, that people. And so here we are in America. Look all around you. Look at the natural plagues and the natural disasters that are afflicting America. You will see these natural disasters increase in intensity. And not only will you see the increase of natural disasters, God has set his hand against the economy of America. She's weakening all the time. And around her, the neighboring nations are turning against America, even as they turned against ancient Babylon. But will the voices of the oppressed in America be heard? That's the question. There is no question that the voices of the oppressed will be heard. In fact, the voice of this brother that speaks for the hurt and pain of our people is being heard in spite of the fact that they've called me everything other than what I am. Let's go Look to how God is blessing us to overcome. We'll go to a break. And when we return, we'll find out what they've been calling him and what he's been calling them right after this. As we led into the break, Minister Farrakhan said they've called me everything but a child of God. They have. They've called you racist. They've called you anti-Semitic. They've called you a separatist. They've called you a man who practices and preaches hatred. What are you? I'm a Muslim. And a Muslim is one who believes in obeying the will of God. And I guess you could say I'm a Christian, too. Because to be a Christian is to be crystallized into oneness with God, following the example of Jesus Christ. As a Muslim, we believe in all of the prophets and we believe in all of the scriptures brought by the prophets. But why do they call me these names? When a man appears with a message in his mouth that can change the condition of a people, the oppressor 
fears the man and the message, if they can color the man with an evil stroke, then the people will pay no attention to his message. So they call me a racist. But what is a racist? If we look at the word race and we look at the suffix IST, that suffix tells us the degree of commitment and dedication of the person involved to the main word. So if I play the violin and I become proficient at it, dedicate my life to it, you call me a violinist. And if I give my life to art and become great at it, you call me an artist, a physicist, a chemist. Well, if so I are love my people. So you you're a racist? I'm saying in the positive sense that I love my people. Let's take a call. Good evening. Thank you for being out there. You're on our voices. Hello. Hello. Hi. What's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Helen. I'm calling from Portsmouth, Virginia. And I want to say uh, hello to your, to your guest tonight. Hello. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I have a solution to the problem. Uh, uh, I think that all the black people that have abandoned their neighborhoods and, you know, been brainwashed, uh, just, just sort of like have a black amnesty and come on back to the neighborhoods and, 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 and uh, help the, uh, the oppressed blacks, the blacks down. And what happened, uh, when, when, black, when some of the black people got a little bit on their feet, making a little bit of money, they wanted to turn white. And that didn't work. Now they're all embarrassed because of this generational drug. But we are to, they're to blame for that. So what I, what I suggest is that, you know, just come on back to your neighborhood. We're going to have a am black amnesty. Just come on back and say, I'm sorry, I made a big mistake. Just come on back and just help our neighborhood. I even had a supervisor tell me one time when she got on her feet, I would never go back to a black, this black neighborhood. Now, isn't that something for a black person to say they have gotten on their feet? You know, this is what calls these young people wild like they are now. Okay, and, you know. let's get his response. In all fairness to the caller, if every black person in America went back to the black community, whatever the black community is, would that help the problem? Uh, I think that the black community is bereft of positive role models. Most of those who make it, and I put that in quotes, because many who appear to make it are only about three paychecks away from the condition Two, that one. they just left. One paycheck, so, one paycheck. <laughs> but what we do need is our professional people, their skills and expertise needs to come back home to lift our people up. But are we receptive when we come back? Because the in-house fighting among us is unbelievable. And we carry our fights to the streets, unlike most marriages where the arguments are contained in the house, we spill out in the streets. Are we ready to open our arms for each other? Because some of us are so angry that if I knock on your door and say, Brother Farrakhan, I'm here to help you, you will attack me because I don't speak like you. I don't look like you. I'm darker than you. I'm lighter than you. I'm in this sorority. You're yeah. in that fraternity. Stop yeah. me if I so go Sister too Beverly, far. No, but what you're pointing out is the horrible condition of our Holocaust. And that's why the message that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad brought to us is a message that cleanses, purifies, straightens up this kind of mentality and makes us accept ourselves and accept the brilliance among us for what it is because we need it. But we can't just bring black people back, as sister said, bring them back into the ghetto and we just have an amnesty. That, I mean, that's a beautiful sentiment. Right, but, it, but it won't work. But we have to teach our people, both those who have left the ghetto and those who remain, that we can be acceptable to ourselves. You have said that we can be acceptable to the point that if the United States gives us money, reparations, that we can take that money, find us a place, either in the United States or Africa, separate ourselves from America, and do well together. Is that realistic? It's more realistic than integration. We've tried this hypocritical trick <clears throat> <clears throat> called integration. But in reality, Sister Beverly, black people have been separated ever since we've been in this country. That form of separation was called segregation, which is a forced separation by a superior on an inferior. But even under segregation in the South, 
black people had our own bus companies, our own hotels, motels, restaurants, you name it, we had it. But the moment integration came, the black economy in the South broke apart. And now we don't have any of those things. And worst of all, we don't have what is called integration. So now, what is the solution to the problem? Welfare is given to a people uh, to what we call subsidize them. My mom was a welfare recipient. I can't knock it. My mother used it with wisdom and discretion. And with that welfare, that black mother of mine went to work sometimes cleaning white folks floors, but she was a magnificent seamstress. And so she would sew at night and she put my brother and myself into music school. But welfare help, had its value. But wouldn't reparations be considered welfare also? No, welfare has a different um, motivation. Everywhere America has gone, she has taken indigenous native people, put them on what they call the dole, which weakens them spiritually, morally, and makes them totally dependent on America. This is the problem in the Philippines, in the Far East. This is the problem with black people in America. This is a problem everywhere in the world where you're trying to suppress and oppress people. Reparation is a form of justice, recognizing that we've done something wrong to a people and we want to do something to repair the damage. All right, what would we do with it, though? If, if we, it is possible to do what you say, hypothetically, to take, because, I, I, see, I'm not sure that we don't have as much right to this soil called America as anyone else. We have designed it. We have saved it. We have shed our blood for it. So why then should we give in? Why shouldn't we say we fought, we died, we created lights, we created souls, we gave you blood plasma, we gave you the light. But why should we not say we are Americans? Well, you know, I heard Malcolm once say, you know, a, a cat can have kittens in an oven, but that doesn't make them biscuits. <laughs> you know, you can be born in America. That doesn't make you an American. What does? You Color? Know, no, no, no. It's the rights and privileges of an American. The real definition of American, according to their dictionary, is one of European descent not belonging to the aboriginal people. So from the very definition, we were left out of it. And certainly when the founding fathers said we the people, they didn't mean we us folk. They meant we, them folk. Now here we are trying to fit in a house. And you're right, Beverly. We have as much right to this, in fact, more right to this than white folk themselves. I'm not saying that all black people should just pack up and go, but reparations means not just money, but land into which we can go to build a real future for ourselves and our How people. Minister Farrakhan, are you going to get white folks to give black folks money? Because what, and, and that's exactly what we're talking about here, here's money for the pain and suffering that I've caused you. In order to do that, they, the whites who are in the power structure, not all whites, controlling whites, are going to have to admit several things. One, systematically, they've discriminated against us. Two, they've discriminated against us to the point of death. Now, they are not even willing to admit during the month of February, which is Black History Month, that we have even played a historical part in this country. How are you going to get them to admit that they were racist to the point that they'll give us money? Of course, the President uh, Johnson had what is called the Kerner Commission. They have already admitted it. It's a historical fact. They have written it published it. It's in their libraries. But the Supreme Court has pushed that back. The Supreme Court has said during the Reagan administration, that's not so. We don't need affirmative action. Look at the court's decisions. We don't need to do that. And the attitude of the average white American is that we have already bent over backwards for you folks. You are dumb, stupid, illiterate, don't want to work. 
kill each other. You shouldn't live in the community. And we have done enough for you. Well, of course, uh, sister, you know, the condition of black people is such. There's only two alternatives. Integration now is a physical impossibility. So either you separate us or you annihilate us. Now, the annihilation process is going on right now as we speak. How long do you think black folk are going to take this kind of treatment? And if in the twinkling of an eye in Eastern Europe, people rose up and overturned an existing government in a matter of a week or two, what do you think will happen when 30 million people decide, look, we've had enough. We're not going to take this anymore. Either America does justice by us or the country goes up. We'll take a break. Which way are we going? That's what I want to know. Which Separation way we or annihilation? Can we still listen to what you have to say right after this? We're continuing our conversation with the Honorable Minister from the Nation of Islam, Minister Louis Farrakhan. And remember, the lines are open and you can join in when you dial 1 800 344 BETV. A curious thing happens to a man when he goes to prison, and I have been dying to find out what it is you do. When a man in jail is exposed to the Nation of Islam, when the brothers in prison who are Muslim, talk to the young men in prison, something happens to them. It is a physical change. And everyone out there watching knows what the, I mean. You can tell the man is different. When the outstanding representative from the Nation of Islam in Washington, D.C., Minister Muhammad, went out to the communities with a few Muslim brothers, the drug pushers left. What are you able to do? What's the magic? It's not magic at all. It's just the knowledge that we have of who and what we're dealing with. Black people aren't really criminals by nature. They're criminals by circumstance. When they get into prison, they have a chance to be to themselves and to think. And when they're in that state, we introduce them to the knowledge of themselves. Once a person is turned on to self-knowledge, then they begin to take on the virtue of learning. Malcolm X is a perfect example. Malcolm, as you know, was a pimp, a hustler, a bank robber. He left school when he was in the eighth grade, and he looked like most young blacks out there tonight, without hope, in despair. But when he heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it quickened in him the spark of self. And that man read everything in the prison library and came out and there was not one scholar that debated Malcolm who could defeat him. And I suggest to you that those brothers and sisters in prison, when they're exposed to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it makes the difference. But do I have to be, because I have been exposed, but I'm a Baptist, do I have to give up my religion to embrace a philosophy that I may concur with? Not at all. You know, we're not saying that people should be converted. What we're saying is that people must be taught. And once you understand that the faith that you have and the faith that I have and the faith that someone else has, it's the same basic faith given to us by God, not from the Bible, not from the Quran, but God has given us this faith, faith by nature. So what happens is that faith needs to be fed and evolved so that we become men and women of faith. Then we can do that which people say is impossible. All right. I want to give you an impossible task and we want to be specific. I am extremely fearful that we are going to lose an entire generation of young African-American men. Quote the statistics. I'll have to one out of four. We are looking at a very violent young man, angry, eating his own flesh, turning on his mothers, 
his grandmothers, his sisters, his brothers, turning on himself. Now, what would you do? What is your plan? How is your plan any different than anyone else's plan? How would you get at this young brother? You know, we are exceedingly successful. Dr. Alim here in Washington can go into any of the high schools and we can go into prisons as I go into prisons. Some of the most unruly of our people inside of a few minutes, they are disciplined at attention. I was taken on what is called death row among young black men who don't have any chance of parole. Their whole life is to be spent behind bars. And the warden of that prison did not want me to go in behind the bars. I said, I have to go in and talk to them. He said, well, if you're taking a great chance. We went inside. Those men sat down around me and within 15 or 20 minutes, you could see light and life coming into their faces. And I called the gods. I said, come and look at these that you call animals. These are human beings. Now, these young people that you're talking about who are cold and violent and brutal, that is the fruit that we have produced then we're to blame. I don't say we're to blame. I say it is the natural process when you and I have hoped for freedom and longed for freedom, you have to have a generation that is strong enough to fulfill that hope. So fulfillment doesn't look like hope. And this generation is violent because we live in a violent time. This generation rejects the education because the education is unfit for them. They reject religion, they reject their parents because God does not want this generation feeding from the same garbage that we have been fed and that we are trying to feed them. I have a problem with that because education, as I've said many times, has never been directed at us. Yet we survived and we were educated without turning on each other. We didn't have programs, but we fed each other. We clothed each other. We were able to stick with each other when it was a much more fearful world in terms of our own individual safety, walking across the street in a community that was predominantly white for you as a black man and lifting your head toward a white woman could get you killed, castrated. So now the white, the young black man does not have that to be concerned about. He doesn't have that kind of fear. Why is he giving up everything that blacks before him fought so hard to do? Where is the missing link? The missing link is the lack of continuity of knowledge that can continue the struggle. Those young men out there are the greatest generation that we have ever produced. But they're not going to listen to the sob story of mom or dad or teacher or preacher or politician. They're born to hear the word that Farrakhan is preaching from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Are you saying you're the only word out there earlier? You said it was just you and Jesse Jackson. And then you said earlier also that there were lots of voices. Are you saying that the only real voices out there in the African-American community is your voice in Jesse Jackson? And what does that do to all the other leadership? Well, look, sister, I'm telling you, and they, if you walk with us through the ghetto, our children are not listening to anybody. They're not listening to Jesse. They're listening to Farrakhan. And that's what's happening in America today. It is true. There are many voices, but there's only one that black people are listening to. Why? Not because of the way I part my hair, but it's because of the message that I have that will affect black people positively. What is your message? What do you say to us that hasn't been already said? Bear with me a moment. Sure. We've been told that we are inheritors of the thrones, kings and queens. We know our history, some of us. And when we have an opportunity to talk about it, we remind ourselves what we have been able to do under unbelievable conditions. So what do you say that will make us rise above what we already know and do something with ourselves, survive? You've heard the message. 
And maybe you have internalized that message. One of the mistakes that we've made is we think that our children have heard that message, but our children have really not heard that message and they're crying out for that message. And when that message is given to them, they respond. They are coming into the mosques literally by the hundreds, literally by the hundreds. Then let me stop you for a moment. Then that suggests then that you're the only place that they can go to hear the truth. Then you're saying that black leadership is a deficit, that the black press has not fulfilled their needs. Are you even saying that maybe the black church has not done what it's supposed to be if they're coming to you? There's a combination of all of those things. The black press is possibly our greatest friend, but the black press is strapped financially. Black people do not support it. Black businesses don't advertise in it. Therefore, black uh, newspapers don't have the wherewithal to send a reporter to actually get the facts. So the black press is actually the slave of the white press. Whatever comes over AP, UPI and Reuters, that's what the black press prints. So the black media is stunted. The black church, in order to come into the 21st century, they have to preach a revived message. The black church has been the instrument that white folk have used to opiate, to sick, to, to make black folk acquiesce to white tutelage. Young people are not going to the church, they're running away from the church. And that's why I'm in all the major cities talking to the pastors, trying to help the pastors to revive that message, the true message of the gospel, so that together there won't be just one voice, Farrakhan, as a student of Elijah Muhammad, and all of those voices that come out from me, but all of us can speak with the same voice and be of one mind and lift our people together. We'll take a break. When we return, let's talk politics. And let's talk politics with you. Let's talk about the Democrats, the Republicans, what they didn't do for Jesse Jackson, and why we're not voting. We're continuing our conversation with Minister Louis Farrakhan. I've been seeing you everywhere. You have been on every major network. I'm impressed. You have been on every talk show. You've been looking like a politician. Are you thinking about running for office? Never. I'm a spiritual man, and I love the spiritual work. I'm actually, I came here to Washington at the invitation of the Washington Post and the Washington Times at an editorial board meeting. Surprising to me what they did with my words the next day, I uh, then became somewhat of a... Uh, what did they do to your words? Didn't you say you'd like for us to go back to Africa? Did they misquote you? No, they did not. But they didn't tell it exactly like I said it. I said that we need reparations first. We have a stake here, and we haven't given up our stake there. We want dual citizenship. I was talking about first letting the prisoners go. Since we can reform them, and America is spending from twenty to $35,000 per inmate, which is an awful lot of money, then give us the prisoners, since you can't rehabilitate them, don't have the desire, let us do that and let us ask our brothers and sisters in Africa to give us territory. Are they willing? I believe that Africa should be willing for some of our African brothers help to sell us into this condition so some of our African brothers have a responsibility to help us get out of this. So you are not politicking. You are talking through the media so that what you said at that editorial board meeting can be clarified? No, what I said at that editorial board meeting for the most part was very clear and they brought it out much as I said it. But I feel that black America needs to know me. White America needs to know me, not as an anti-Semite, a bigot, a racist, but as a concerned human being, concerned primarily with the plight of black people. And I'm hoping that in our last discourse, we didn't give the impression that blacks are at fault for our condition, but as black people, 
We have to take the responsibility now for our own actions. Yes, white people put us in this condition, but we are responsible to help get ourselves out. Do we even know that? Because most of the time, when I say on the air, if your child gets pregnant, it's your fault. If your boy gets in trouble, why didn't you know where he was? If your kid can't read, why is it your fault? People get upset. Do we know we have some responsibility? I Quickly. Think, I think we know we do have responsibility, but we should never forget the hidden hand that has always created the conditions that allow us to destroy ourselves. And we're through for the night. We thank you for joining us. He said, Minister Farrakhan, that he wanted us to get to know him. We hope you have on our voices. Until the next time, God bless. I would ask you, Minister Farrakhan, in view of uh, recent events, for your comments on the O.J. Simpson verdict. Sir. Well, certainly I'm, I'm grateful to God that the trial is over, and I'm pleased that the jury found him innocent, but I'm deeply concerned because of recent polls that showed that 71% of whites felt that he was guilty, and 74% felt that he was innocent of black. And so now that that uh, not guilty verdict is in, the blacks may be happy, but that 71% are very unhappy. And so that means that the community is polarized, racially divided, and into that could uh, be some serious moments for the future. You, uh, your own presence was noted <clears throat> in an indirect way during this trial. Here are, uh, here's a videotape of uh, Johnny Cochran being escorted to and from the courthouse. Those are your people moving uh, about with him in a in, in the, in the cent like sentries, their, their guards. Was this your decision to provide uh, oh, this I protection? Have, I have nothing to do with that decision at all. I'm very happy to see that our brothers uh, were protecting him, and I feel that because of that verdict, Mr. Cochran as well as Mr. Simpson are going to need protection. While the courtroom drama has ended, the real drama is yet to be played out in the American society. Uh, yes, and, and how, might you want, how might you suspect that drama play itself out? Well, uh, Mr. Donahue, here is a man that grew up in a black environment, and because of his great gifts and talents, was brought into another environment. He saw a beautiful young Caucasian woman, and he married her, and from that marriage, two beautiful children came into the world. And this man literally was good and kind to uh, not only his former family, but to his new family, not just his wife, but the sister, the brother-in-law, and family. So now, how does this play? I mean, the sister felt that he was guilty. Some of the members of the family felt that he's guilty. The Goldman uh, family certainly felt he was oh, guilty. Certainly. And uh, Nicole and the Brown family felt that he was guilty. So how then will Mr. Simpson move back into that environment, feeling safe with that kind of spirit? And how can he ever move again freely in white American society with 71% of those polled believing, in fact, that he got away with murder. The DNA marks appeared not only at the murder scene, but in the Bronco, on the sock in his home. We have a high-tech fingerprint of the man moving from the murder scene to his home. And the jury including nine African-Americans, appears to have looked the other way. And there are not a few political observers out there, Minister Farrakhan, who are essentially saying this is a political decision of the black community in 
rage because of the Simi Valley jury that exonerated those who attacked Rodney King, because of the Daryl Gates and the history of the Los Angeles Police Department. This was, in effect, black America looking into a very large TV camera and saying, because of all those cabs that didn't stop for our brothers, because of all that redlining at banks, because of all that police brutality, O.J. walks. Well, uh, I, I think that that is a very sick view. Wait. I think it denigrates the sense of justice and fairness in our people with all the hell that our people have caused. In this country, Mr. Donahue, you will find a love in black people for white people. You will find blacks bending over backward generally to show white people that they are not hateful and racist because of an historical fact of slavery. I would give the members of that jury much more credit that they went into that courtroom not determined to set him free, but determined to listen to the weight of evidence. There was no one who saw the murder. There was no murder weapon. Now you have circumstantial evidence. But the question that has to be asked was there a reasonable doubt? And if those jurors felt that there were in fact, or was in fact, a reasonable doubt, then they were under instructions to bring back a verdict of not guilty. And evidently, they felt that way, and they judged that way. Now, many of us as black people, we've watched our people in courts of law. And I don't know what was in the minds of the juries that judge these cases. We disagree with their judgment. But we had to go along with what the court had decided. But in this case, somebody on television showed um, a, a, a report that said, well, you got away with murder, but we are going to seek revenge. And that kind of spirit is what will break the country apart. That kind of ignoble uh, attitude that cannot respect the very system, not that we set up. That's your system of justice. We just came into your system of justice. And if the court chose eight or nine African Americans or black women, hmm, Two whites and one Hispanic. Well, what moved the two whites on the jury? Did they say, let's sock it to white people too? <laughs> or, or were they overwhelmed by the nine black women? Or were they of the same mind that the evidence was circumstantial and that there was, in fact, a reasonable doubt. Here is Ron Goldman's father. This is before the verdict. Yes. Talking about Johnny Cochran and his bodyguards, uh, young men from, who are members of uh, the Nation of Islam. Watch, Mr. Goldman. We walked around for the past days, screaming, if you would, in a silent way, that he has, his life has been threatened. And who does he choose to walk with? guards from the Nation of Islam. He's talking about racism, and he talks about hate. Who does he connect himself with? Now, the Nation of Islam have come here, and they have offered to embrace us and to help us so that we can go in and out. But now, there's something wrong with that. That's uh, O.J.'s sister. What would you want to add to that, Minister Farrakhan? Well, I, I, I would just say that Mr. Goldman, of course, is an aggrieved father. And sometimes, as the Quran teaches us, when there is injury, sometimes there's hurtful speech. And sometimes we just have to overlook hurtful speech. After all, uh, Mr. Goldman lost a son. And I think that the only way that 
um, Mr. Simpson will be free to walk in American society again with his head held up is, number one, if the jury found him innocent, was there a rush to judgment? Should not the police department now mount a very vigorous investigation because if he did not do it, somebody did. And whoever did it should be brought to justice. And if that does not happen, Mr. Simpson and Mr. Cochran's life in white American society, given the move toward this conservative right-wing attitude, is not going to be very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Were you impressed with the uh, professional uh, performance of uh, Christopher Darden? Yes, I think he did the job that he's hired to do. He's, he's a prosecuting attorney. And it is his job to prove the people's case against uh, Mr. Simpson. I have no problem with him professionally, nor do I have any problem with Johnny Cochran. You know, to say that he overplayed the race card. Well, the race card was established in a racial deck that Mr. Cochran was dealt. And it just so happened that he had the Joker, and the Joker was running wild. Mm -hmm. Well, you do liken this to a game. Uh, you're close to saying, uh, you know, as long as it worked, it's right. The end justifies the No, means. I would never say that. You know, no one escapes justice. The courts is, are full of liars, lies, and miscarriages of justice in the name of justice. God knows who killed Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. And if Mr. Simpson did it and escaped the law, man's law, he can never escape the law of God. The, um, the law of God, however, would not, in the event of his guilt, express itself until after his death, isn't that so? Not necessarily so. You know, um, the, the Bible teaches that God is not mocked, that whatsoever a man soweth, the same shall he also reap. And so, you know, that man has children, that man has family. God is not a God that loves ugly or evil. And this whole system of justice, if you can lie better, if you've got more money, you can buy your way through. I don't know whether this happened in this case, but God does. But I know as a black man in America, I've seen many times where blacks, in our judgment, were mistreated. And a white jury let the white person off because it was a white thing. But God never sleeps, neither does justice. And I believe somewhere along the line, in this life, before death, we will pay for what we do. Mr. Simpson will, I will, you will, we all will. And if we live a delicious life, God says, prepare slaughter for the children, for the iniquities of their father. So if, if it were me, I would want to be careful about what I do in this life because I love my children and I love my grandchildren and I would not want to bequeath to them a will that has money in it but a will that also has in it the evil consequences of my deeds. Uh, are you... Um... <clears throat> Mm -hmm. 
Is it possible for you to say that in your heart you believe O.J. Simpson is innocent? You know, I did not know, but I found tears in my eye when he was found innocent. Somehow or another, I hoped that he was not guilty. Somehow or another, I wanted him to be free in my heart of hearts. But if he were guilty of that, then he's guilty, you know. But that, it was never proved to me beyond a reasonable doubt in spite of the quote-unquote mountain of DNA circumstantial evidence. So he's free today, but yet not free. He walked out of the courtroom to the cheers of some, but to the abject hatred of others. And so I would appeal for calm, I would appeal for reason, and I would appeal to the chief of police, uh, um, um, William. Williams, to find, uh, but to put some investigators on this in a vigorous manner. I know that Mr. Simpson can never be tried again, but if he didn't do it, whoever did it must be brought to justice that Simpson and Cochran and Mrs. Nicole Brown Simpson and Mr. Goldman and that family, uh, their breasts can be free knowing that the guilty has been brought to justice. One more question, if I may, please. When you say you found a tear in your eye on, on the occasion of hearing the uh, not guilty verdicts, was that tear an expression of, of sorrow? No. It was an expression of joy for his family and for him that after nearly 18 months of being accused and being the subject of, of television cameras all over the world, denied access to his children. And then today, the judge said, you are free, you may go. I saw his son break down. I saw his daughter, I saw his sisters, I saw his elderly mother wiping a tear from her eye. And it was the sense of the relief of that family, and I felt that same relief. Yes. You also saw the, Brown, the Browns and the... Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And the family of Nicole. Yes, I did. And the Goldman. And I watched, you know, Mr. Goldman throughout. And I watched his wife put her hand on his shoulder the other day to sort of try to calm him. But that man lost his son. And he believes with all his heart that O.J. is guilty. And so he acted out of that expression. I don't call it anything other than what I saw. Grief, sadness, and hurt that the man that he thinks is guilty got away with the murder of his son. Now, however, our nation appears to be quite overwhelmed. Certainly media is overwhelmed with the O.J. Simpson verdict. You haven't said anything about uh, Mark Furman, Minister Farrakhan. What mm -hmm. might you want to say? Well, it's unfortunate, but nevertheless it is true that the attitude of Mark Furman is pervasive in law enforcement throughout this nation. Mr. Furman's attitude that the only good black person is a dead black person and that if he had his way, he would take all black people and burn them. This is something the jury did not hear. He not only used the N-word one or two or three times, but it was consistent with uh, this man. And this man should not be blamed now. I mean, he's just a part of a system and he is a symptom of a system that is exactly what is in his mind. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we as, as black people have been knowing that there are Mark Furmans in every police department in America. We live with them on a daily basis. Yeah. So if, if I may just close this by saying 
to every police chief and every police captain in America, whenever one of your men is accused of wrongdoing, using police powers in an improper way, instead of hiding and covering and defending, those kinds of police persons should be prosecuted and this will give people confidence again in the police. But right now, with what happened in Waco, with what happened uh, in Iowa, uh, with uh, Idaho, Ruby Ridge. Yeah, Ruby in Ruby Ridge. Ridge. The American people are beginning to see government and law enforcement as an enemy rather than a friend. And ultimately, this is going to lead to anarchy. So I think it, it, it needs all in law enforcement to rethink their mentality and begin to reprocess their people. Sir. Yeah. Minister Farragon. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. King uh, dream, dreamed of the day that uh, children will be recognized by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Do you see a day when whites will be allowed to join the black Muslims? Yes. Yes. There, you know, I must say this, uh, uh, some of my own brothers may be shocked in, at this, but you asked me a question, and I have to answer you truthfully. If you look at the message of Jesus, it started first very narrowly among the lost sheep. And Jesus was told, go ye not in the way of the Samaritans, or in the way of the Gentiles, but to the lost sheep. And then at a certain point he said, Go ye into all the world, to every nation, kindred, and tongue. If you will look at the message of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it first was directed to black people because we were in the worst condition. But not only are we lost, the whole human family is lost. And therefore, <laughs> therefore, yes, and therefore. therefore, the message has to evolve. And we have to evolve. And I'll close that point by saying, in Christ, there is no Greek, no Jew, no bond, no free, no male, no female. This means that we all are going to have to grow out of rabid nationalism, sexism, racism, materialism, in order to claim Jesus Christ yes. as our Lord yes. and Savior. Very interesting. I am obliged. I am compelled to uh, ask you this in the wake of this gentleman's question of you. You're, those people closest to you, the young men we see here in our studio, and on those occasions when you've been with us in the past, have been most impressive. They are <laughs> straight and of military bearing, well-dressed, clear of eye, drug-free, Highly compassionate, generous people. It, following your observation about Jesus and the ideals of Christianity, why wouldn't you bring your power, a power that can fill Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden, to integrating your own staff, your own followers, why wouldn't Jesus and Muhammad be honored with this multiracial presentation from if, a man who has so much influence? If you notice, um, you know, Muhammad started among Arabs. And then the message spread into Africa. And then into Europe. And then into Asia. So if you look at the world of Islam, it is not a world that is just black. It is black, brown, red, yellow, white. The whole human yes. family. But your and, world isn't. Yeah, my world starts with the black man. <laughs> but it doesn't end there. And I will say that every day there are more and more Hispanics, Native Americans, Arab Americans, Asian Americans, and white Americans who are attracted to the message of Islam. They couldn't be attracted to a black message. But there had to be a black message to give us love of ourself again, root in ourselves. But that was a medicine. But after you've accomplished the results, you don't keep taking the medicine. Uh, and presumably you don't have to keep 
You don't have to have a monoracial uh, entourage accompanying you. Soon you will see, you know, in, in years to come, you will see. Years to come? Yeah. Well, look, how many years have we been waiting? <laughs> We'll be back in just a minute. President of Student Council of my high school, I would like to know, at the Million Man March, will there be a high school level of youth representation? Definitely. Yes. All that we're doing is about the future and the present. You represent our future, and so there will be youth representation and youth speaking at the march for youth on behalf of you. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Minister. Alaykum, I'm here from London, England. And um, I would like to know, um, when you got um, refused entry to Great Britain in 1985, was it? Um, what was your message going to be? And what is your message now to the brothers and sisters in London, England? Thank you. Well, as you know, in 1985, because of the, the uh, word that Farrakhan was an anti-Semite, a racist, and a bigot, the Home Secretary of, uh, of England felt that I should be persona non grata. And that ban on Louis Farrakhan still exists today. But you have heard the word in London. And you have... Yeah. Yeah. And you have accepted the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I hope one day soon, God uh, willing, I will be able to visit you in London. Sir. One of the things I have wondered about, I've, I've heard a lot of scripture quoting, uh, what is your theological, philosophical background, basically theological background, and is there a potential that religion can be misused just as much as the law? Of course. Religion has been misused as much as the law, in fact, religion's misuse has been the basis of legal misuse. If we were not, and let me give you an example. You know, we are supposed to be the children of Ham. And as you know, Ham was one of the sons of Noah. And when Ham laughed at his father's nakedness and, and drunkenness, Ham was cursed. And he was doomed to be a hewer of wood and a drawer of water. And this uh, curse is what scholars, and they happen to be rabbinical scholars who started this, that we were the Hamitic people who were doomed to be hewers of wood and drawers of water and were cursed black. And as a result of that teaching, sir, many black people began to hate the color of their skin, the texture of their hair, the, their origin in Africa. So yes, religion has been misused, can be misused. And I pray to God that I will never have that history attached to my name, that I would misuse religion for any wicked purpose, but just to use it for God's purpose, which is the uplift of human beings and the development of their gifts that God has put within. Religion, religion was never meant to be a crutch. Religion was meant to give human beings the expression of their God-given gifts. Your first one, we come back. Washington, you wanted to say. What I wanted to say was, especially on the O.J. Simpson case, is that I'm glad that he was set free. Um, again, with the police department, I'm a district leader in the 68th District, Part B. Of I had, the city of New York. Yes, of, in Manhattan. I had to call on the Nation of Islam because the police were not doing their job as soon as the merge came about. And the only ones that came to the aid of the people were the Nation of Islam, NOI. Okay? They, I, what I believe is that people are scared of the truth. And the Nation of Islam represents truth. Mm -hmm. Sure. Please, please, please. Running out of time. Uh, Minister Farrakhan, I just wanted to ask you uh, this particular question. First of all, I want to say I'm an active member of the NAACP, and as an active member of the NAACP, we, are, uh, we understand 
the difference between personalities and realities. You are a reality and you're representing a reality for us as a people. And as a professor at City University, I am very concerned about the fact that there are more college-aged students, potential students, in prison than there are in college. Right. Your question? My question is, after the march, could you say something about what we are going to do in reference to these issues after the march? Thank you. Yeah, hold it. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, sir. Yes, the most important day is not the day of the march. The most important day is the day after. And we are gathering leaders and scholars from all over this nation. We intend to hold them together to address an agenda and a program that covers all of the basic needs of our total community, economic needs, educational needs, political needs, etc. You know and I know that this new prison industrial complex that in the name of fighting crime intends to fill new prisons with black males who will probably in three strikes and you're in for life, it degenerates into a new form of slavery. So we intend to introduce legislation to the Congress to repeal aspects of the omnibus crime bill. And we intend to create an economic uh, a development in our community that we will be able to give jobs to these young men to give them an alternative to drugs and crime. And in that way, we can reduce the prison industrial complex and increase college enrollment by black males. I wanted to answer this gentleman's question, Mr. Donahue. Richard, Richard. He asked about my, my um, theological training and background. I never went to a theological cemetery, I mean <laughs> seminary, pardon me. And uh, I don't have a degree in theology, but I'm in good company. Moses didn't, Lot didn't, Noah didn't, Peter didn't, Paul didn't, Mark didn't, Thomas didn't. All the disciples of Jesus were common people that Jesus met fishing and he told him, come follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. My teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, qualified me. Uh, and, and, you know, I go in and out of schools of theology. And they pay very good attention to my exegesis of scripture. In fact, many Christian ministers tell me they take my tapes, study them, and my tapes become the basis of their sermon, and which makes me feel we'll pretty We'll be good. back in just a moment. Do you support Time Warner's dis divorce from, separation from, their unit that produced uh, rap music offensive to many, many people? Well, they're, they're a little slow. Uh, they, they made a lot of money from it. But, you know, I want to say this in, in, in closing, that gangster rap is really a mirror of American society. They are young people being gangsters, playing gangster. But the real gangsters are in the White House with, with suits on that destabilize governments, murder leaders, gangsters in the state house, gangsters in city hall, gangsters in corporate America. Only these young people are bringing it all out in the open. So before you curse the fruit, Check the tree that produced it. And, and we'll be back in just a moment. Sir, you wanted to say briefly? Uh, first of all, I want to say salam alaikum to the minister. Salam. I just wanted to take this brief moment to thank you for teaching me how to be a father, how to be a man, and I'm glad that you'll never bow. Yes, thank yes, sir. Hold it. Yeah. There's a lot of emphasis being placed on those organizations and individuals who are not supporting the march. Can you, in closing, briefly give us a list of the names of those who are in support of the march? It's better to talk about those who are in support. Those who are not in support should not be penalized by us. Whosoever will, let them come. And don't 
don't denigrate those who don't come because the Day of Atonement will be here next year and maybe they'll be with us then. May I ask you to join me in thanking Minister Fairfax? He would like a million men to gather, a million African-American men to gather in our nation's capital. We'll talk to him uh, during this hour on the purpose of the march, what, what uh, provoked the idea, and uh, who's for and against the Million Man March, which is to take place in Washington, D.C. on Monday, October 16th. Uh, as per our agreement, we have uh, allotted... Uh, approximately 50 uh, seats in our audience to people who support you, who are uh, politically and religiously on your side. And uh, we have also conceded that uh, you, uh, you have told us you wanted to make an opening statement, and we are pleased to give you the opportunity. Ms. Minister Farrakhan. Thank you. <clears throat> because of the fratricidal conflict within the black community because of the joblessness, increased poverty, crime, and violence, and because of the ugly image of the black community, particularly the black male, we felt that we needed to give the world a vastly different picture of who and what we really are. So we called for one million black men to come to Washington sober, dedicated, committed to first accept the responsibility of freedom, and second, to accept the God-given responsibility to be the heads of our families, the maintainers, providers, and protectors of our women and children, and the builders of our community. We called it a day of atonement, a day when we atone to God for our sins of commission and omission, and from that high moral ground, then call this nation to repentance for the sins that she has committed against black and poor people of this nation and other nations of the world. And this is why a march on Washington. Will women be welcome to march with you, Minister Burke? If women came, we would never say to our sisters, you shouldn't be here. But we wanted our women to at last see their men standing up, taking a responsible position. Women have been our leaders, our teachers, our mothers, our companions. <laughs> And women have generally been in the forefront and have suffered tremendous abuse by our abandonment of our responsibility. So we wanted to say to our women and girls, we are sorry for what we have done and now we are ready to assume our responsibility. And most, and most of our women applaud that effort even though some in the beginning thought it might be a macho march that excluded women, I'm very happy to tell you, Mr. Donahue, that women have been involved in the planning of this march from its very inception. The, uh, and white uh, people who would uh, wish to march along with you would be similarly welcomed but not encouraged to take part. Do I understand well, the position? I'm calling for a million black men. But the scripture says, whosoever will, let him come. <clears throat> so if white men came, and if Hispanic and Arab American and Asian American <clears throat> men came, Native American men came, we would never say that you are not welcome. All are welcome, but we are calling for one million black men who are the brunt of a media blitz that says we are savage, we are maniacal, we are bestial. We are criminal, and we reject that image and want to change it. Yes. 
Um, it is also... <laughs> Let me just uh, hopscotch around the country here. Here are some comments, Mr. Farrakhan, uh, of people of note regarding the Million Man March, October 16th, Washington, D.C., a Monday. Coretta Scott King had this to say. Everything is right about a million man march, marching to assert their manhood and responsibility for their families. Philadelphia's mayor, Ed uh, Rendell's endorsement, uh, consistently in these columns, in these uh, newspaper articles, he's identified as white and Jewish. Mayor Rendell of Philadelphia. Any march or rally that focuses attention on how the budget cuts will hurt people in this country and people in this city who are poor, not just black, but poor, Anything that focuses attention on those cuts would be positive. And I hope the march is one that is very issue-directed, and to that extent, I think it's going to be positive. NAACP statement of the chairwoman, Evers uh, Williams. The concept of the march is one that the NAACP understands, even though its executive board has voted to withhold formal endorsement. The NAACP, one of the oldest in the trenches longer than most, Organizations reaching out, often being clubbed by a white racist establishment, fighting for the brotherhood all these years, is not coming in any official capacity. Does that not disappoint you? Well, certainly, we would love official sanction from the board of the NAACP, and we hold the door open because this march is ecumenical, it's broad-based, it has the right moral tone, and it would give Ms. Evers and the board a level of comfort, feeling that there won't be anything said that she would disagree with, I don't think. We're not there to bash white people. We're not there to bash Jews. We're there to encourage our people to take the responsibility that God has given us. We certainly will make demands on government. We certainly will deal with the public policy issues that ill affect our people. And certainly we will make demands on corporate America, but our first demand will be on ourselves. And I might say that one of the things that we hope to do is to establish an economic development fund. We're going to ask 10 million of our people to put aside $10 a month in an economic development fund that will nurture business within the black community. And one of the first things we're going to do, by God's grace, is to call the NAACP in and ask them, what is your budget for the year? And we will write them a check so that they will never have to be beholden to corporate America or white philanthropy. Thank you. Is the cynics might wonder whether the uh, check you plan to write for the NAACP is a partial atonement for what Benjamin Chavis has been accused of taking from the NAACP during his tenure as its executive director? Well, I, I, I won't uh, dignify that, Mr. Donnie, but with all due respect, um, a ben, co sponsor, I should ben say, of the Chavis has been diligent and hardworking. I cannot answer for Mr. Chavis's role as executive director of the NAACP. He's still a member and loves that organization as I do and as we do. That organization has fought for us when we were not able to fight for ourselves, so we owe it a debt. And we feel that that organization will be strengthened if it's not beholden to the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, or any white philanthropy. I own bigs of the uh, Women Speak Out for Peace and Justice. Here uh, you have a woman whom you would describe uh, reverently and, uh, and uh, with respect as a sister. Here's what she said. It's wrong, she said, to exclude women. And I'm sorry they are doing it that way. I believe men and women need to work together. I think they could accomplish more. Well, it's true. Men and women are working together on this march. 
men and women have worked together. But this, uh, you must admit, Mr. Donahue, is not an easy task. If a million fleas showed up in Washington, there would be concern for a nuisance factor. If a million bees showed up in Washington, there'd be a war room strategy uh, because of the potential sting of these bees. A million black men that are considered maniacal, savage, bestial, criminal. You know that the armed forces will be on alert. You know that the National Guard will be on alert. We know that every police person in that city has been canceled from any kind of leave. There is an element of danger, particularly if agent provocateurs are in our ranks. So we do not wish for our women and children to be exposed to that kind of danger. So what we've asked is, of course, we have 10,000 marshals. We have many African-American patrolmen, police, and guardians who are going to do their part to see that order is maintained. We're going to deputize as many as come to help us keep the discipline and the order. However, our women have a very important uh, a role to play that may even be more important than the march itself. Because if a million come to Washington, 39 million more are left at home. What will we do at home that day? We call it a day of atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, uh, we don't go to work, we don't go to school, we, we're, we're not going to spend any money in the malls, we won't be in the bar rooms, we won't be in the nightclubs, we hope to do no profane thing. And our women are organizing all over the country to make sure that the stay at home or the day of absence is felt politically, socially, as well as spiritually. Well, yeah. you're... You're suggesting that you gather a million men in one place, that somehow a woman in the midst would be in danger. Quite the opposite would be no, true. Never I, would a woman feel more protected than on that. I, I wouldn't say endangered at all. And so if women came, we are not going to say to our women, you're not welcome. But you are suggesting However, that you don't want to put them in harm's way. What and, and I am also suggesting this. You know, when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated and they had the service outside of Ebenezer Church in Atlanta, I read an account of the service and it, it noted that there was a young woman and she was dressed with a rather tight jeans and a young man was standing behind her and he rubbed on her, and she rubbed on him, and this ugly scene took place in the midst of the funeralizing of a hero. Now, our men have to be taught, in my judgment, how to respect our women. And that setting with a million men and a few women in close proximity to these men may encourage a behavior that we're trying to get our men to uh, forego and to put away from us entirely. We're not there seeking marriage. We're not there as a mating game. We're there to instruct our men, to teach our men, to honor and respect our women, and we can do that better. Yes. if they are not present. Will you likewise, son? Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Very true. The vast majority of all of us, regardless of color, are responsible and certainly respectful of women. Those who are not are the ones that wind up on the evening news. That is most certainly true with regard to the black com community. Show me a person on the evening news with his coat over his head and handcuffed, and I'll show you a black person. And this is a bad image. This is a stereotype. It is, it does provoke racist fear. I believe that. But in addition to saying that, that 
these million men have a responsibility to stand up and be responsible, will there be a speaker at this rally who will encourage them to pay their child support? Will it be that specific? Will they go back home and raise these children in a culture that finds more than half of African-American children growing up in a single female-headed household? Well, that's what we have to address. And that's why we are calling our men so that the unfair burden that we have placed on our women to be both mother and father, that we've abandoned our homes and the factories that were once in the inner cities have abandoned the cities for the suburbs or for foreign markets, which means that a lot of our men are unemployed and unemployable. So we have to develop an economic strategy. And we feel that with $433 billion of expendable income coming through our hands each year, there is no reason why we shouldn't be able, with the tremendous intellectual resource in our community, to put these men to work so that they can pay for their children's education and become good and responsible. Partners. We're in New York City with Minister Louis Farrakhan, and we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Continuing with commentary about uh, your march, approval, disapproval, Minister Farrakhan uh, and uh, Benjamin Chavis are, is his, your quarterback, so to speak, helping you put this together. Cornell West, professor of philosophy and religion at Harvard University. This march is for everyone who has been disrespected, denigrated, and disregarded. It's about us coming together for the sake of the true, the beautiful, and the good. Uh, Michael Black, a pastor of the 800-member Bethesda Baptist Church. No need to say, a Christian church. The issues are good, says uh, Reverend Black, but the banner under which we would be labeled is not a representation of what we believe in. Islam is, has a racial bias. To me, in a sense, it seems they hate white people. We, as a people, do not hate other people. You, likewise, do not have the um, support of a number of large uh, organizations that are Christians. Um, not, uh, the National Urban League has not endorsed your march. There is a split here between that seems to be uh, defined religiously. Islam versus Christianity. Would you kindly speak to that? Certainly. We're not trying to refight the Crusades. The Crusades really is a European Middle Eastern tragedy that has nothing to do with African people. In fact, were it not for black African Christians, Islam would never have flourished in the world. For during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the great persecution of Muslims in Arabia, they had to flee out of Arabia into Abyssinia or Ethiopia. And some of the detractors of Muhammad came to Abyssinia to ask the Negus of Abyssinia to uh, uh, get these uh, Muslims out of this country. So the Negus listened to the uh, ones who were detractors of Muslims, but then he asked the Muslims. And the Muslims quoted from the 19th chapter of the Quran, which is named after the mother of Jesus. And when the Muslims, when, when the Nagus learned that Muslims believed that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, that Christian leader never expelled the Muslims to be persecuted in Arabia. So that conflict, which is European, has nothing to do with black Muslims and black Christians working together to solve the problems of our people. Certainly there are Christians who through misunderstanding would not wish to march, but I've not asked them to march under an Islamic banner. They should march under the banner, they should march under the banner of Jesus Christ and march under their cross. I have not asked Hebrew Israelites to march under the banner of Islam. They will march under the Star of David. The nationalists will march 
under their own red, black, and green. The, 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 the Masons, the Elks, there are over 200 black organizations nationally that have endorsed the march. So really, we want these Christian brothers of ours and sisters to participate, but whosoever will, let him come. The national, the national. <laughs> the National Baptist Convention, 7.8 million members, uh, has not endorsed the march. What is it? They obviously feel that this is a promotional idea for you and for your Islamic faith. And that what is, would make them feel that way? That is unfortunate. The suffering of our people is tremendous. And while the church, with no disrespect, has older people in it, the funeral parlors are filled with young people. Men are not in the mosque. They're not in the church. They're not in the synagogue. They're not in the temples. The black men are in the streets. We call for religious leaders across all faith traditional lines to join together that we may call black men and send them back to the church, the mosque, the temple, the synagogue of their choice so that these men may be spiritually and morally taught. The uh, director of the Washington Anti-Defamation League is David Friedman, a man who has done more than any other single person to collate uh, your statements, many of them offensive to Jews. He made this point. This event has provided you, Mr. Farrakhan, with a great deal of visibility. This is Farrakhan's event. It's another step up the ladder, making him religion, uh, uh, illegitimate. He also thinks it's ironic that you would co-op the word atonement, day of atonement, as in the Jewish faith, when you've had nothing but slanderous things to say about his own. And that, again, is very, very unfortunate. I'll deal with first um, his remark of my going up the ladder. If it is a ladder that I'm going up, it is because God has erected it and if with all of the evil propaganda that has been written and spoken of me has not taken me down, that again is because God wants to take me up. Um, it is sad, and I hope that Mr. Friedman is not saying that unless a black man is legitimized by white people, we are illegitimate. I, I, I am very legitimate in the black community. And if I am allowed to speak to the American people free of these 30 second sound bites, I will also be legitimized with white people as well. And we'll be back in just a moment. I agreed to show your 900 number. I certainly did with Governor former Governor Brown of California. Ross Perot has shown a 900 number. I myself am obviously going to have to get a 900 number to get through the rest <laughs> of my life. Uh, the 900 number as shown here is intended to do what? Let's, uh, uh, well, this, this is 399 in the first minute. You must be 18 years or older. Uh, and we're separating ourselves from this because money's involved. We want to well, this is the first time in history, in our history, that we've had a march that we're paying for. And much of the burden of the march has been borne at this point by very dedicated members of the Nation of Islam and other members of the black community. And we're hoping that through this 900 number, persons that want to see the march successful, it is a tremendous expense, will uh, call that 900 number, and your contribution will go to help defray the expense of right. the Million Man March. I know you want to speak to atonement, and you certainly will have that opportunity. The Reverend Jesse Jackson has not only endorsed the march, but is it your understanding that he will march? Yes, it is our understanding that Reverend Jackson, as some other Christian pastors, had some concerns 
about the ecumenicity of it, the moral tone, and would we, it, would it just be spiritual in tone, or would we address those public policy issues? And when the Reverend Jackson found that it was ecumenical, broad-based, and we intended to address those things that were his concerns, he and Reverend Shopton and many other Christian pastors um, came on board. I called for Reverend Jackson from the very beginning to be a part of this because it never was intended to be a Muslim thing. It was intended to be just what it is, a broad-based amount. Is Reverend Colin, is the General Colin Powell invited? Of course. Is he invited in a particular way? Has there been a personal invitation extended to this man? Well, we uh, hope to speak with him probably sometime today. He's a general. And uh, if there are a million of his troops out there, I would, uh, I would hope that the general would feel this uh, free to come and address his brothers and tell them from his heart what he feels we ought to be doing to make a better image and a better reality for ourselves. Uh, and we'll be back in just a moment. For those of you interested in information or... News, and a contribution. Uh, 1-900-97-MARCH. If you joined us late, part of the money raised would be... Uh, Extended to the NAACP uh, as an original... Well, not, not this. Not this. But no. Just the $10 this, from $10 million. That's people. right. Mm -hmm. No, this is to defray the tremendous expense of right. putting the money. Why have this on a Monday, Minister Farrakhan? Why have it on a day of work? Why not have it on a weekend? We did not want a frolicking spirit of the revelry of weekends, the drinking, the partying mentality. We wanted those men who were willing to make a sacrifice and those who were working on a Monday, they would make a sacrifice to be there. That says they have the right mentality, the right orientation of mind. Secondly, government is in session on that day and we wanted to make a statement to government and to impact on government to register our dissatisfaction with the contract with America that we feel is a contract on America and especially the black and the poor. And to those uh, proud Americans who would say, I have to work harder on Monday for the government because I'm white and we're absent so many of our fellow workers who went to the march, you would say. Well, it's good that um, white America sees black folk absent in the malls, in the bar rooms, absent in the nightclub, absent in the air, uh, in, in the airports. The reason we want this Day of Atonement is because we want America to see what America would look like without our presence. And if you want us in America, we have to be here with justice. And if you don't want us, then just say, like uh, Moses uh, told Pharaoh, let the people go. Pharaoh should just say, well, we don't want you and then let us go with some alimony. <laughs> is this going to be... Will this be... Appreciate your uh, support. At, remind you that the time, the clock is ticking here. Yeah, will this be a march or a gathering? Is there, well, is there a actually, route? Actually, the march takes place when all of the buses uh, start moving from Seattle, Washington, Miami, Florida, Houston, Texas, and all parts of the country moving toward Washington. That is the actual march. But when we get to Washington, we will gather at the steps of the Capitol on the mall, and it is a 23-block area that we have to put sound and picture through that whole area, and it really is a tremendous expense. Now, Minister Farrakhan, may I ask you to speak to one of the most forceful condemnations of you and this whole idea that has surfaced in recent weeks. I speak of the column by Richard Cohn in the Washington Post. Here is part of what he wrote. Black manhood needs to be reasserted. 
Mr. Cohn quotes Ron Walters, a political science professor at Howard University. To that end, writes Richard Cohn, he and other notable blacks are supporting the so-called Million Man March, whose organizers are Louis Farrakhan and Benjamin Chavis, one a racist and anti-Semite, the other an alleged sexual abuser, harasser. If this is asserting manhood, then the children of Hamlin were mighty men one and all. They followed the Pied Piper right into the Wesser River. Mr. Cohn continues, if Professor Walters and other black and white really wanted to assert manhood, they would tell Farrakhan to kiss off. Farrakhan is a virtual renaissance man of hate. Whites, Jews, homosexuals, and he's not so hot on women either. Unlike the jury, he, Farrakhan, exonerated Mike Tyson for raping Desiree Washington, suggesting she had it coming by going to the fighter's hotel room. You bring a hawk into the chicken yard and wonder why the chicken got eaten up, he quotes you. You can see why the march excludes women. Well, you know, Mr. Cohen, while well, well, I'm sure he, he means what he says, you know, we march alongside white people. We went to war with white people, for white people. He's saying Mr. Cohen, his family, and all the whites that benefited from 300 years of our chattel slavery. So hell, if we could walk with you all, ain't no excuse for not walking with me. I have raped no woman, robbed no man, kidnapped no one, enslaved no one, done harm to no one, all I do is tell the truth. And if your footsteps in the sands of time are bloody, don't blame me. I'm just pointing out where your feet have yeah. gone. Did you say... Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, did you say you bring in a hawk at the chicken yard and wonder why the chicken got eaten up? Did you say that? Yes, I did. You're comparing, you're comparing uh, Mike Tyson to a hawk and Mike Desiree Tyson, Washington to a chicken. Mike Tyson, at that time in his development, had a history of disrespect and abuse of women. And she should have known For this that? young girl to leave that ho uh, her hotel at that hour in the morning when she was supposed to stay there in her room. Doesn't mean she could be beat up. Doesn't I didn't mean say that. I didn't say that, but I never believed that Mike Tyson actually raped her. That's well, my that's opinion. That's a different point. That's You're my suggesting opinion. she's at fault because she went there. Women have to be able to flirt. You cannot go into a... You can't... Wait a minute. You know, this is an entitlement. No, wait. I mean, well, let, no, listen. No. Imagine. Imagine a woman you love, young and single, charmed by a man, goes into a hotel room, perfectly innocent, feeling, feeling the wonders of amour, and winds up with two black eyes, and you would look her in the eye and say, well, honey, what'd you go up there for? Not right. Wrong. Well, let, let, me, the let, me, let me just say, let me just say, if we're all that decent, if we're all that decent, we would never have gone in the room in the first place. And if we're all that holy, and many of you know moral correctness, and you teach moral values in your home, you would not send your daughter into any hotel room with a strange man at one o'clock in the morning, a man who had the reputation that Mike Tyson had. And if you would do that, you would be a mother or a father that is shirking your responsibility as a wise parent and a wise guardian. I have five daughters, and I would never allow my daughter to do that. And if she did that, of course, and she were raped, well, it would be a little different with us. But I would, I would certainly punish my daughter yes. for going into that environment. And it is consistent, is it not, with the uh, precept of Islam, that uh, your daughters will remain virgins until married. And, and they did. By the grace of God, my daughters remain virgins. And we'll be back in just a moment. Once again, referring to, uh, here's Mayor Schmoke of uh, Baltimore. 
I think it's going to be a very positive event, he says, speaking of the Million Man March. It's simply a statement of African-American men that we want a more positive image portrayed about us and our accomplishments. It's also a symbolic statement that we intend to work on a number of problems that have plagued our community and not just wait for others to do so. Mary Frances Berry, a member of the United States Civil Rights Commission. The Million Man March is important because most of us are resolved to the fact that if we can get a group of black men together for something positive, it would be good. We all know that Mr. Farrakhan is controversial, but the whole march is not about Farrakhan. It's too important. It's too crucial. Here are uh, Congressman Peter King and Jim Saxton, both Republicans, two members of the House. The march is nothing more than a major publicity stunt for a vicious racist. And finally, a colleague, uh, Congressman Donald Payne, himself an African-American, uh, serving uh, in Congress from New Jersey. Uh, he's the chairman of the Black Caucus. Washington's hostile political climate makes black participation in the march necessary. We have seen a brutal attack on such vital programs as Head Start, School Lunch, Pell Grants, Medicaid and Medicare, and we cannot sit still as it happens. Just as the 1963 March on Washington aroused the country to the seriousness of the civil rights struggle, it is our hope that this will be a defining moment for African American men in this area. So, a million. The Reverend Martin Luther King, I have a dream today. 250,000? A moment in American history. 250,000. You're saying you're going to draw four times more than that? Oh, I don't know what we will draw, Mr. Donahue. We pray that God will bless us with a million men. But whatever he blesses us with, we thank him for that. I want to say with respect to atonement, uh, Mr. Friedman said we, we borrowed something from the history of the Jews. And I, I would like to, to say to the members of the Jewish community, the children of Israel set a foundation that has a direct correlation with what we are suffering today. The children of Israel in their 400 years in Egypt, God through Aaron gave them a day of atonement because their sins were such that God could not bless them unless sin were removed from them. So it is with us today. We are filled with sin and the wages of sin is death and our community has died. So the scripture says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Right. We need forgiveness, and we need a healing. So the day of atonement is not quite borrowed from uh, the children of Israel, but you prefigured what we would do in the last days of this world. Here is the Washington Post quoting you on the, regarding the day of atonement. You proudly make the point that, it, that uh, the idea it has its origin within the Jewish faith. And then you say this about Jews, the Washington Post quoting you. In spite of the negative opinions of others, in spite of hatred, in spite of oppression, you say, Jews have managed to survive through all the centuries with dignity because of the Day of Atonement. So you see the Jewish people as dignified. Certainly. You see the Jewish faith as dignified. Certainly. I that, never see. <laughs> that is not consistent. Not consistent that with the propaganda. That is not consistent with the audio tapes that make it quite clear that you were coming down on this gutter religion in a most personal and angry and disrespectful way. And you smile when you are presented with the evidence as if to suggest well, you know, those who would suggest that you would be capable of this behavior you know, don't know what they're talking Mr. about. Mr. Donahue, the sad thing about this and you and many uh, of the Jews in the audience or in, in our radio or te television audience is that, you know, no matter what I say, that re re repudiates that sentiment every time my name is mentioned. It is thrown in. This is the man that said Judaism was a gutter religion. Hitler was a great man. That's propaganda. And to any Jewish person that's in this audience, 
There is no righteous Muslim who would denigrate the faith of Judaism since Islam didn't predate Judaism. It comes after Judaism right. and Christianity. Can you? So when I said that the Jews have gone through oppression and they've come through it because of that day of atonement, which allows Jews to reconcile their differences with each other and to clean their slate from sin so that God could continue to bless them. That's not yeah. my condescension. Yeah. That's an absolute fact. Yes. Do you acknowledge the possibility that some people might have misunderstand, uh, understood the intention of your remark? Oh, there is no question about do that. You, do, they, do they have your apology for this misunderstanding? The, no. No. They do not. No. Because I'll give it, you a wait, chance wait. to make your case yes, I'll uninterrupted make when we come back. Here's the 900 number. Let's, uh, the 900 number... Uh, 997 March. That's 1997 March. The cost is $3.99 a minute. Uh, this is for information or anyone who wants to make a contribution to help pay for the March. The Million Man, African American Man, March on Washington, October 18th, on 16th. Monday. I'm sorry, October 16th. 16th. Jesse Jackson apologized for the Heine Town comment. Because he stood made up it. like a brave man and yeah. said, like, like a real man and said, I'm sorry for those who are offended. What's wrong wait, with an apology wait. from you? I'm there is nothing wrong with an apology if I, in fact, had made that statement. But the press... I heard you say you got a religion on which, the tape. Of course I did. And I explained to you what I meant, and I never mentioned Judaism. Now, if I had made the statement that Judaism is a gutter religion, then I would have to apologize. But since I did not make that statement to every Jewish person in the audience and watching this, I don't feel that I owe you an apology for an, a statement that was made by the press and not by me. I am not too big to apologize. If I offend you, that's not uh, anything to get up and say, I'm sorry. All right. That's a human thing to do. And since this is the day of atonement, and reconciliation, I think we ought to sit down on this eve of atonement and get it together. And we'll be back in just a moment. The march is October 16th, the Monday, Million Man March. You're hoping that uh, one million African-American men will gather. I have time only to allow you to say in this, in this holy season of atonement, we are asking all of our people to observe this. We fast sundown the night before to sundown the day of. And I want to say to the members of the Jewish community, in this season of atonement, it doesn't only mean reconciling differences within our community, but it also means reconciling differences with those outside of our community with whom we have a difference. So let's sit down and talk. May I ask you, how are you feeling? Considering I'm feeling great, really great. I'm thankful to Almighty God for the operation and the quality of life that it has given me since the operation. So I'm feeling 100% better than I was feeling before the operation. And I'm looking forward to getting stronger and better each passing day by the grace of God. When you say considering, what do you mean? Well, before the operation, I was in very bad shape. As you may have heard, um, I had seed implantation for prostate cancer. Uh, we started with 40 seeds and it seemed to do the job and then the cancer came back. So they put 180 more which is 220 radiated seeds. And I went on a world tour right afterwards, but over time the seeds burned into the rectum, burned into to the urethra, and there was a communication, a fistula, a hole that communicated the colon 
with the urethra. And so we had an operation in 2000 that was to patch the fistula. And uh, unfortunately, in four months, we tested and it held for a while and then it broke. And then urine was coming from the anal channel. And so since that time, it's been seven years now, um, I've had a problem with urine coming from the wrong place. And finally, uh, I, I wanted a colonoscopy to make sure that my colon was okay. And they found uh, an ulcer in the uh, area of the rectum. And as long as urine was passing it, it would never heal, which meant that I would have to have another operation. And then it got so deep that what was to come from the colon was coming from the penis, and what was to come from the penis was coming through the anal channel. And so I was in constant, constant pain, and I was dying. And it got so bad, some of my naturopath physicians told me they, did, they didn't want me to take the operation because it was horrific because it was a complete pelvic exoneration where everything in the pelvis would be taken out. And my medical doctor said if I didn't take the operation, I would surely die. So I was like the Bible says, halting between two opinions. So I went to pray and I said to God, I said, Father, I am your servant and whatever I want you to force me in the direction that you want me to go that's in harmony with your will. And within 10 hours, I went to the bathroom to push out some of this foreign matter from the penis and a stitch in the side came and blood began rushing from the anus. And I lost about four units of blood. A right rush in the bathroom. No, 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 not in the bathroom. I lost maybe a unit or half a unit in the bathroom, but on the way to the hospital. And then in the hospital, I was vomiting, but nothing was coming up and pushing out blood at the same time. So they had to put the bed in Trendelenburg, which is the head down and the, uh, the foot up so that the remaining blood could be in the cavities and in the brain and in the heart so I could remain alive. So they put me in the ICU and, and then I went into what they call a fibrillation where the heartbeat began to beat at 140 to 180 beats per minute. And uh, then my daughter became, as a nurse, became very concerned and they called the family around me. And that didn't stop for 13 hours. And then when they stabilized me at last, then they sent me to Northwestern University Hospital from St. Anthony's Hospital in Michigan City. And that's where I remained for five weeks. And then um, I came out uh, uh, four weeks after the operation and then had the, um, the uh, speech six weeks after the operation. I'm sitting here and my mouth is agape because we knew that you were sick, but no one knew the details that you're telling now. And I'm flabbergasted because even though, you know, it had been rumored and people were saying, oh, he's close to death, he's, we still didn't know how sick you were. And I sick. didn't either. <laughs> I, my doctors told me that if I didn't get the operation, I was melting down, losing weight constantly and in tremendous pain. But they told me I would die and, and I didn't want the operation. But God forced it on me and I'm so grateful that he did. Did you ever say during this, why me, God? Why oh, no. your servant? Oh, no. Never. Because there's no one who comes to God on an easy road. If he tried Jesus and Muhammad and Moses and the prophets the way he tried them and they were his most honored servants, then who am I 
that I should not suffer some misfortune even though I am a servant of God. That's how you test the fiber of the servant's faith. So when Jesus went to the cross, he never broke his faith with God. He knew that God would deliver him. And I somehow never thought that it was time for me to die. Although that, I, I did, I, I can't say I didn't think it, but I didn't believe that it was my time, though I thought it. That was my next question. Did you think that you were going to die? Did you reconcile yourself to the fact that maybe this is it for me? Well, you always are conscious when you get to be 73 in a few months, I'll be 74 by the grace of God. You're always concerned about your mortality. So I was trying to set things in place inside the nation in case I passed away. But I never deeply thought that I was going to die. I believed that God was going to deliver me. When you say set things in place inside the nation, like what? Who? You, let's talk about your, who, who's your predecessor? Who's going to take over the nation and lead it once you're not the leader, and God forbid that you're gone. Well, I'm not the leader now. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the leader, and I'm functioning every day on the guidance and the inspiration that he gave me. One of the things that Elijah Muhammad told me, when his teacher, Master Farad Muhammad, was leaving, he pressed in his hand a piece of paper. And when his teacher left, he looked at the paper, and it was the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If God becomes your shepherd, you don't need a leader. You already have one. So when we sit at the table, right. a council, the head of the table was, is, and will be the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And all I'm concerned about is whoever sits in the seat, are you infused with the ideas of Muhammad? And will you carry out those ideas? But I don't have a successor, quote unquote, right. picked. I, I'll leave that to God and I think I'll be around a little while. <laughs> so I'll have time to look at everybody quite well. Are you looking for a predecessor? Is that an active search of yours? I think any person in leadership is always concerned about what will be after him. The Quran, which is the book of scripture of the Muslims, asks the question, were you present when death visited Jacob? Of course you weren't present, I wasn't present, but God was present, so he revealed the, the context of Jacob's death. And he called his sons to his bedside and he asked them, what will you serve after me? And the son said, we will serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Once he knew that they were going to follow in his path, he closed his eyes for his eternal sleep. I need to know that this is not the fiefdom of a charismatic brother mm -hmm. who knows that he will pass away. I need to know that those around me are infused with the love of Muhammad, the love of his idea, the love of the Quran, and want to see the growth and development of the nation beyond where the minister leaves it. And I believe I have a group like that around me. Okay, then who? Oh no, I can't call a name because I'm not locked in on any one name. That's why I put a council together. You know, the Mormons, you have never probably interviewed the leader of the Mormons. No, nobody knows who he is, and they may know his name, but he's a part of a group that carry out the principles of the founder of the Mormon church. I'm hoping that these will carry out the principles that Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan taught. So you won't need any charismatic individual. The group that is leading infused with those principles, wrapping their lives around those principles, will lead the nation in the proper direction. Some speculate it's going to be your son. I can't say that, because this is not a father-son 
thing. It could be. But I won't say that. Because a son may be your son of the blood. Doesn't have to be your son of the spirit. And that's why in the Muslim world, the father gives something to the son. But not in this world. In our world. In our world, it could be a son, but it doesn't have to be a son. I'm fortunate that I, I have a son infused with the spirit of his father and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad also has a son that's assisting me. That's not only his physical blood, but also born of his father's spirit. And he is assisting you because there was a yes. rift, but no more rift. Oh no, this is another son. This is someone and there, of course there's differences between the Imam and myself, but we get along, we're brothers. You spoke of unity with, um, between Christians, between Muslims. Did you also mean the Imam as well? Oh, of course. Of course, he sent greetings to the convention that we may be two communities, but we're under one God. That is my brother. We grew up together. We have differences of opinion. But those differences of opinion, by the grace of God, will never cause us to do to each other what we see Shia and Sunni doing to each other in Iraq. Do you ever see the two groups together? Yes. Yes, of course. In one group. One yes. group. One nation. Yes. Yes. It's only a matter of time. As we are all growing... We're all in school. We're all evolving. And as we evolve, we start doing this. We used to be two parallel lines. But you know, there's such a thing as a monorail. <laughs> so the two parallel lines will come together eventually. All right, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. But since we're, since we're going on this path, um, you have any regrets with that when it comes to what happened after the death of Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? and how the two groups separated. Do you have any regrets when it comes to that or anything? Well, it's always painful when groups that were one split after the death of a great leader or the passing of a great leader. But people have to follow the drama that they hear. And I've always heard Elijah Muhammad as the drummer that I wanted to dance to his beat. And if the other beat was not the beat of Elijah, then I couldn't continue in that chorus or in that line. So as I left Imam Waratuddin Muhammad, I never wanted to be uh, in opposition to the point where we fight one another, but I'm in love with the Father. And I believe in the correctness of the Father's vision. And so I decided to try to rebuild the work of the Father because I didn't believe that a man so great should be written out of history. You talk about walking to the beat of your own drummer and hearing your own music. You're a musician? Yes. Right? You gave it up? Yes. To join the nation? Yes. The Bible puts it like this. Jesus speaking. If any man would be my disciple, he must first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Peter was fishing. And when he met Jesus, Jesus told him, leave your net alone. Come follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. I was a musician. I drew people. But I drew people from the spirit of entertainment with the beauty of my song or my dance or my violin. But now I have a chance to draw people to the beauty of a word that doesn't entertain but transforms human life. And that's so much greater to me than music. But now God has given me back my music as my life comes uh, near to a close. So I'm working on an album now that hopefully will be uh, released the end of this year. And that's what I hear. So you're playing violin? Yes, I'm playing violin. I'm Are you singing? singing. I can't dance on the album. <laughs> <laughs> you can dance on a video. Now feel free to dance for us no, if you want to. No. <laughs>
<laughs> my days of doing that are over. <laughs> what are you singing? I, I'm singing uh, a song that um, that um, reflects the course of men's lives, and it comes from the movie Troy. Mm -hmm. But it really is a takeoff on the life of the master. When Jesus was about to go, he gave his disciples two things that they should use in remembrance of him. One was the bread and one was the wine. And when Prophet Muhammad left, he gave his followers two things that they should look at in remembrance of him, and in doing so, they would never deviate from his path. One was the Qur'an, and the other was the way he lived the book. Well, this song from Troy is called Remember Me. And I wanted people to think of their brother. And you always think of persons more when they're gone. Mm -hmm. I always thought that Luther would be with us, and Luther's gone. And when I hear his name, you know, chills come over. I want to hear more of Luther. James Brown is, is gone. Bradley is gone. And you know the person, you love the person, but you don't think of the person every day, and then all of a sudden you hear they're gone. Well, Jesus knew he was going. Muhammad knew he was going, but he wanted the followers to remember him. So that song I hope to sing. What is it? Can you sing it for us? Oh, no. Oh, come on. No, no, no. <laughs> what is it called? Remember Me? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to find that. Do you know the lyrics? Yes. Um, the lyrics are, Remember, I will always be there as long as you keep me. In, in your remembrance, for I am that bright star that, in, in words, gives you light, but it fades into the rising sun. And as long as you can remember the works that I've done, then I will never die. That's not perfectly quoting the words, but that's the sentiment. And that really is about Jesus, because he's called the bright and morning star. And as long as we remember the great ones, the sacrifices that they make, then they live even though their flesh is rotting in the grave. But Minister, you know what, I have to put you in that category as well, for someone who people would want to remember. You have to think of yourself that way and the impact you've had on the, not only the country, but the world. Well, I would hope that I have done something in life to serve God and to serve my people and to serve humanity that would be remembered. And if it pleases God, when my death puts a period to my testament. Then the historians, if I'm worthy, will come and gather the bits and pieces of my life and assign me my place in history if I deserve one. You really don't get your reward while you live. Mm -hmm. Most of our great ones, they died they had audiences that loved them, but it was after their death that history corrected the wickedness of those who feared them and hated them and gave them a beautiful place in black history and in world history. So here's your chance. There are a lot of people who have a lot of opinions about you, not all positive. And I'm sure some of them who... That some of the opinions and some of what you've heard probably hurt you deeply. Here's your chance to correct it. What do you think? People say that you're an anti-Semite. I've never been an anti-Semite. From the depth of my heart, I know that I've never hated the Jewish people. And for me to hate a Jewish person because of their faith tradition would make me less than a Muslim 
less than a righteous person and would make me a bigot and a wicked person. But I am critical of Jewish behavior in relationship to black people or in relationship to the Palestinians. I'm critical of America's behavior and I'm critical of my own people's behavior, but it doesn't mean I'm anti-American or anti-black or anti-Semitic. But the Jewish people are so very sensitive after the Holocaust. And it seems as though uh, anyone that criticizes from a well-meaning perspective, not out of hate, but out of hope to see change in behavior, change in strategy, change in relationship. Jimmy Carter is no anti-Semite. He wrote a book hoping to contribute to the dialogue in America concerning the suffering of the Palestinian people, yet he was called an anti-Semite. And that is wrong, and that is what produces more and more dislike of those voices in the Jewish community who cry wolf every time somebody says something that's critical. Do you, can you understand the words of why they might sting some people, the words that you say about, about Jewish people or that have been... That's I have never said words about the Jewish religion or about the Jewish people that I can't defend with truth. That's why dialogue is so important. I have been waiting for a dialogue for 20, I think maybe 25 years now, from 1984, 22 years. From whom? From the Jewish people. I've sat with rabbis, they visited me in my home, I visited with them in their homes, but the things that they ask of me are not things that I can do. You want me to apologize, but you don't want to face me in a dialogue and show me where I'm wrong. I'm not a proud man. If you show me where I'm wrong, I'll go before the world where I made a statement mm -hmm. and not only apologize, but I will seek your forgiveness in a repentant spirit. That's better than what America has done. That's better than what Jewish people have done in their part in the horror of the transatlantic slave trade. We've never gotten an apology. We've never gotten an apology from the United States government. Nobody wants to apologize to black people and repent of the action and do something in atonement. And when the government even tries something like affirmative action, it gets such a backlash from the white community. Oh, you're favoring them, but you've set a whole people at naught. Now, what do you want to do to make up for the wrong of 400 years of injustice that have less left us in a savage state. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that a savage is a person that has lost the knowledge of self and is living the life of a beast. And when you look in the black community and you look at the black on black crime, you look at the hatred exhibited by black people for their own people, something that never existed even in the cruelest days of slavery, something has been done to us that must be repaired. And that's the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and that's my work. It's a work of repair. And the Jewish people can be such a great help in that effort if they would remember, yes, you had a part in our degradation. Why not have a part in our uplift? Why not work together with those who want to repair the damage? It's so much better if we work together. Are you sure you're sick? <laughs> your, your voice is ringing in this room and it's vibrating. So that's, I don't think you're ill. Well, that's my that, passion. That's your passion. I can feel your, the passion. It's coming off of you. So what would you, what would you have people do? You said dialogue. You feel that you have been misunderstood. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there are those who have a vested interest 
in coloring me this way. They raise money off of me. This is a vile anti-Semite. He's anti-white. He's anti-American. He's anti-gay. But when you come in my presence, when they come in my presence, you can't feel any spirit of hatred emanating from my heart, but my words, my words of correction, my words of rebuke, my words of exhortation, my words of condemnation of a nation that has done us wrong. That doesn't mean I don't love the country in which I was born, but I want to see change, change for the better of America, change for the better for my people. Do you ever think, though, you know what, I, I could have said that a different way. Maybe I didn't say that in a way that people would understand it. Or yes, it. yes, of course. I could have said it in a much better way. But when you, I came to national and international public attention, I was in a battle. People were calling me the new black Hitler. I have never pulled or plucked one hair from the eyebrow of a Jewish person. I trade with Jewish stores right now. I, if I can't find something that is halal, I go to the kosher store to buy the food. So please, if I were anti-Semitic, if I hated the Jewish people, I would organize uh, uh, boycotts against their businesses. Y you wouldn't see a Muslim putting a swastika on a Jewish synagogue because our Quran forbids us and even advises us if we see someone doing that to a church or a synagogue or a cloister that we should stop them from doing such. I didn't plan at all to get <laughs> to, to even bring this up but since we're talking about it, and I don't want this to drag on. But you, you, again, you say you could have said it, you could have said things better. But times were different. It was a different time. Exactly. You know, I don't know whether you're married, but if you're not, if you have a lady friend, sometimes you might get in an argument. And in the heat of the argument, you're speaking the truth that you believe, but the passion that comes in the heat of argument can sometimes distort the beauty of what you're trying to say to get that person to change some behavior that is ill affecting you. So here I am now, 22 years later, I'm not locked in the heat of somebody calling me an anti-Semite, a black Hitler, and then members of the Jewish community when I spoke in Los Angeles, when I spoke in New York, marching around Madison Square Garden, who do you want? Farrakhan. How do you want him? Dead. How should I respond to that? Well, I'm a warrior. You can bring that out of me right now if you go the wrong way with me. I'm still a warrior. Mm -hmm. I'm a warrior for truth and I'm a warrior for justice. But I'm not as passionate because the climate now is not the same as it was in 83 and 84 when Jesse Jackson threatened the status quo in terms of the Palestinian uh, Jewish relationship within the black community when he wanted to be president. How might you say that this day if you had to re-say it? You know, there's a saying in the Bible that the real Jew is not the Jew with a circumcised male instrument. The real Jew is the person with a heart that is circumcised. And if you look at the male instrument and cut away the flesh, you can wash it easily. Disease doesn't set up in it. So it was advised in the Jewish law and in the Muslim law that the male child should be circumcised. Well, what about the circumcision of the heart? If the heart is diseased with hatred, if the heart is diseased with bigotry, if the heart is diseased with racism, even a pure word coming through a heart like that will get contaminated by the bitterness of the moment. My words were contaminated by the bitterness of that moment of hostility while I was defending myself against charges that were false then and are false 
now. But now you meet me in a, a state of peace. A man that just came back from death's door. So as that and man. And Jewish people prayed for me. Rabbis prayed for me. So how then could I come out of an experience like that? Where Hindus pray, Buddhists pray, Jews pray, Muslims pray, Christians. The prayer warriors in the church went to work to see that God would bring me back. They fasted, they prayed. How could I come out of an experience like that and not feel a commitment to those who prayed for me? So the message of Jesus, though nationalistic in its inception, became universal in its application. The same with the prophet. It's the same with Louis Farrakhan. I started specifically with black people, and that is my focus. But there's no way coming out of the experience that I have just come through, that my message should be anything but a universal message that touches black, brown, red, yellow, and white, people of all religious faiths, all ethnicities, all racial identities with truth, coming from a heart of love, mercy, and compassion. Is there anything you're sorry for when it comes to that whole issue. The only thing I'm sorry for is the way it was taken and the way it was abused. And no matter how often I defended my statement and corrected the view, today, 22 years later, Farrakhan, all these nice things, oh, but he's the man that called Hitler great. And they don't say what I actually said. He called Judaism a gutter religion. They don't say what I actually said. And no matter how I try to correct it, they keep on saying the same old thing. It's a lie that keeps building and building because I don't have control of the media. They do. And so you make Farrakhan a bad fella, but I'm coming out of jail. <laughs> I actually read the entire quote of what you said, and I think what you were referring to was Hitler's army and the way he pulled Germany up, and not, you said, you said what he did to the Jews was awful. It was wicked. Yes. And I said, don't compare me with your wicked killers. I've been over the nation of Islam now for 30 years. You don't have any record of the minister beating somebody, having his brothers that love him go out and hurt somebody, black, white, or in between. That's not our way. And I would hope that that can be corrected. And any Jewish person listening to this, I am anxious to sit with you, to dialogue with you. And if you can show me where I'm wrong, you don't have to ask me to apologize. I'll apologize right then and go before the world and beg your forgiveness. Wow. <laughs> so, let's talk about your speech. I saw your speech and I said, this man is not sick. He has not been sick. He's been fooling all of us. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing. Would you you like know, <laughs> I thought about that the other day. I said, people look at me and listen to me, they say, that man was faking us out. Because so many people thought that I was going to die. And my best friend, who is my wife, she looked at the blood rushing out of me. And she too thought for a minute, maybe I wouldn't make it. I was truly at death's door. But the doctors, who were like God's angels, in the way they did me, and the staff of the doctors, and the nurses, and the certified nurses' assistants, they were all like God's angels the way they cared for me at Northwestern University, at St. Anthony's Hospital in Michigan City. I could not have asked for better care. And of course, my daughter, who was with me 24-7.
But my doctor said, Minister, I've watched you for four weeks since the operation. They said, your operation was so complex, the only operation more difficult is a liver transplant. Now, I don't know what it takes to do a liver transplant. The doctor said, I've been looking at you for four weeks. And I would never say that the operation was a success, even though for all practical purposes, it was a great success, but there are always glitches. Mm -hmm. And as a doctor, I'm looking for the glitches. Did he have an infection, a fever? What, is there bleeding that we would have to go back in? He said, but I've watched you for four weeks, and I don't use this language, but your recovery is nothing short of miraculous. And so when people look at me and say, I wonder, was he faking? Was he really ill? Yes, I really, really was. But to all who are ill, never break your faith with God by whatever name you call him. Because in the final analysis, he's the master of life and death. And if it's not my time, if he doesn't want to bring me in and he wants me to continue to work, then he brought me back. And some are very happy, and unfortunately, some may be a little disappointed that they didn't have a funeral to attend. But um, tell them, be patient. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think, is this a, some, now, here, some people are going to say that you are concerned about legacy now, and this is, is this a softer side of the Minister Farrakhan? No. Now because of... No, I don't concern myself with legacy at all. That's vanity. And when people are so concerned about how history will view them, they do things to enhance a legacy. I don't think like that. But I am an evolving human being. I can't remain the same. Nothing in life remains the same. Once a thing becomes stagnant and there is no change going forward, then there's change going backward. And this is what's wrong with the educational system in America. It is not evolving to keep pace with the evolving mind of the children. And so the methodology and the psychology is of no value. But are we seeing a softer, you don't think we're seeing a softer minister after You're coming out of this? Or is it just a more evolved or a different person because you've I, had this experience? I am a more evolved individual. But you're seeing a side of me that was always there. But as I said earlier, you caught me. Media caught me in a time of conflict. Nobody goes into a conflict mild-mannered. Clark Kent had to change his suit into Superman before he went into conflict. So, so <laughs> the minister had to change his mild-mannered way because He's a warrior. I'm trying to defend myself. I didn't have anybody to defend me, so I tried to defend myself. All right. In your speech, you talked about the war in Iraq. Yes, I you did. You talked about the president. You say he should be impeached. Oh, definitely. The president lied to the American people. What is a higher crime? I wouldn't call that a misdemeanor. That's just a high crime. He lied to the American people, and he knew he was lying. They twisted intelligence to make intelligence fit a policy they had already formed. They deceived the Congress so that the Congress would vote to give him the power to go to war. That's a high crime, and our babies, black and brown and, 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 and Asian and poor white, are dying because of a lie that this man told and the whole world now that was a friend of America after 9-11 has now turned on America and even America's friends in Europe are displeased with President Bush and the imperialist policy of the neoconservatives. And so I say 
There's a window of opportunity for America now, but we cannot stand two more years of this man. This man will throw America deep into Armageddon if he's allowed his way, and the Democrats seem so weak and cowardly to confront this thing. The whole world is watching. What do you think should happen? I think if you cannot impeach him, and of course to impeach him and to leave Cheney, is to leave his boss or one of those who is a part of the architect of the policy for a new American century or the project for a new American century, which is the neoconservative policy of an imperialist America, an America that if we think you're an enemy, we don't have to wait until you make an aggressive move. We strike you first. This is madness. Do you... And I don't want to put words in your mouth because I know it's controversy, but do you, is this comparative to any point in history, what they have done? Can you compare this to any other action that any country has taken against another country? Well, you know, this democracy is modeled after Rome. But when Rome became an imperial power, they had to choose between being an imperial tyrant or a, a republic and a democracy. And when you had these wicked kind of rulers, Caligula and others like that, then Rome became tyrannical. Then you need greater and greater military power to enforce your democracy. What America is doing is bringing democracy at the point of a gun. And at the point of a gun, she wants to make another country democratic, but we're losing democracy at home. This is a sickness, and I'm sorry. We need a regime change in America. I said the whole kit and caboodle. Excuse that expression. I don't know where I got that one from. <laughs> but Bush needs to go. Cheney needs to go. Condoleezza Rice needs to go. That whole administration needs to go, and the Democrats have a chance to obey the directive of the people that voted in November for change, and they are weak in doing it, and they'll pay a price in 2008. Why do you say Armageddon? Because we're at the door of it. I mean, we're in it now. Armageddon, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us, begins with truth clashing with falsehood. That's what's creating the division. The masses of the people are beginning to rise. And the only thing that makes the masses rise is the presence of truth. And that's why Jesus was hated, not because he just brought a new kingdom. He was hated because the poor heard him gladly. The poor hear Farrakhan. And when the poor listen to Farrakhan, whether they're poor white or poor black, it will produce a change in the way they think. Our government is wrong, and it needs to change. And if it will not change, then we need to get rid of it and put in a government that will guarantee the American people life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness guaranteed by the Constitution. You're talking about Democrats, one of which who's running for president who lives in your very neighborhood. What do you think of him? I like him very much. I'm not saying that I'm going to vote for him. But I like him because he's fresh. He doesn't come with a lot of the baggage that those in politics that have been in politics and been corrupted almost, or not almost, corrupted by it, sold out to the moneyed interests, sold out to the multinational corporations, sold out to the international bankers. So when you look at Bush, you think you're looking at the president? There's another power behind him. When you look at Blair, you think you're looking at the, the, the prime minister? You, there's another power behind him. When you look at Merkel in Germany, you think you're looking at the head of state? But there's another power behind these people. And the powers that are a dog in the whole world are the international bankers that finance both sides of a conflict. Do you think that Barack Obama is the answer to George Bush? No. I think he's capable of being an answer. But the powers that contend with presidents, 
I'll go back to President Jimmy Carter when he was a governor running for the presidency. He saw UFOs. And he said when he became president, he was going to open the file, which is secret, held by the government. When he got in office, we didn't hear any more from him. People say things when they're running because they don't know the powers that really control the house that they're going to live in. And that's why Barack Obama is clean. He's, he's fresh. But the powers are eating at him right now. The powers that want to control him are at him right now. And how can he get to be president unless he raises a hundred million dollars? And who of the poor people have a hundred million dollars to give him? And who will provide him with the money so he can contend with Mrs. Clinton and her big bank or Giuliani and McCain and their growing bank? So the people that bankroll you, they're the ones that ultimately call the tune. So what so, are you saying? I'm saying that no matter who sits in the White House, if you don't uproot the structure that corrupts them, you still don't have a president. You have a figurehead. And frankly, that's why I say America needs a regime change. And just like you have to go into the floor when there's pipes underneath it that break and bust, you got to uproot what's under the government of the United States of America or the American people will never have what the Constitution guarantees. Do you think Barack Obama can do that? No. Absolutely not. He's a good person. And he's looking at this thing with the beautiful heart, the beautiful eye of a beautiful person. He doesn't, he knows some of the ugliness of politics because he's been in it long enough. But the real wickedness of the face of politics, you're looking right into the face of Satan himself. And Satan doesn't intend to be uprooted by an upstart from Chicago or Miss Clinton from New York. Satan is the boss. This is his world. And he can only be uprooted by the one that is anointed with power to uproot Satan. And that is the Mahdi or the Christ that comes into the world. Then who can do it? Who can uproot that? I just right? said it. But, who, but you don't. None of these. These are victims of satanic influence. Religion is controlled by Satan. That's why religion is ineffective. The divisions in the Muslim world, that's satanic. Muslim killing Muslim? Muslim bombing another mosque of a Muslim? If they did, that's un-Islamic. We've become so insane because of injustice. If we strap a bomb on ourselves and go kill another human being that didn't bother you, this is madness. And that's why the Mahdi or the Christ must come into the world to clean up religion. Because the church's garment is dirty and it needs washing. The bridegroom is coming and the bride has dirtied her garment with adultery because she's gotten in bed with the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, if that happens through a person, just as Jesus walked the earth, is there a person you think that's on this earth now or that will come who can do that, who can uproot the evil? That's why we say that Allah came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad because we believe that this human being is clothed in the power of the eternal God to set up the kingdom of God on earth. And there's no one here now that you see has, a, has those qualities. He's here. He's around. That's why the world is in the shape that it's in. That's why you see the clashing because his aim is to set down every tyrant. And he's called in the Quran, Maliki Yaumiddin. He's master of the law of requital, master of the day of judgment, master of the day of religion. He's a human, but he's in the world to do a job, and the job is being done. The house is being divided. The house is being set up. 
on one side not black and white but on one side wrong and one side right which side do we want to be on bush is wrong he must get right the government is wrong it must get right and we in the black community the black community is living wrong and it must get right we have to choose today between two signs one of life and one of death and if we make the wrong choice, we get the right answer. Is there someone which who, is death? I'm sorry. No, you don't have to apologize. So, what is there someone alive or someone we know of who you'd like to see in the White House? Would you like to see Barack Obama in the White House? You know, of course I would. But what I'm looking at is a reality. Put him in the White House in these troubled times. He has a good understanding of Islam. He has a good understanding of Christianity. He has a growing understanding of politics. He's so universal in the way he grew with a black absentee father and a white present mother who nurtured him and gave him the best of education in madrasas or schools in Indonesia. But if you watch the way he went back to his absentee father's home and respected his paternal grandmother and all of his relations on that side and the way Africa responded to this son of Africa, well, he can't just say, I'm the son of Africa. He's the son of a woman from Kansas. He's got to respect her who nurtured him. He grew up in schools in Asia. What better person to put in the White House because black and white are at each other. But here's a man from Chicago who got the white vote in southern Illinois. That's no lightweight thing that he did. He's a black man today that can gather the youth, young whites, young blacks, young Hispanics, young Asians. He's a beautiful human being, and I wish the best for him. But I know the powers that are already tugging at the brother. And I know if he ever gets to the White House, he'll understand it better by and by. <laughs> I knew you were. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. So, uh, <laughs> um, is there anything? Have you spoken to him? Yes. Because I know you guys did the Million Man Movement. Not, not, not recently. Right. But I have spoken with him. Yes. You did the Million Man Movement. With, I think in in ninety five. Not 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 ninety five. In oh five together. I, I don't know that uh, Barack Obama was present. Okay. Let's talk about the Million Man March in 1995, because I remember watching that and helicopters covering it. Is that, one, is that one thing you look at as one of your most successful moments, or do you look fondly on that, or is it something that's just sort of... Because that was of course, that made an impact on America. Of course I look fondly at it. The motivation for it was black men and the horrible image that was being portrayed by Hollywood of black men. We had the picture colors, we had the picture um, uh, the uh, menace to menace to society. society. We had these movies, New Jack City mm -hmm. and others, that went all the way around the world. But it showed black men in a low kind of life where we are dragging America down. That's the image that it projected. So that if America decided to move on black men, and in the black community, 
the violence was getting so terrific that even politicians and mothers were calling for the National Guard to come into the community. If the slaughter of black men took place in that time period, the whole world would not have cried out because they're only killing a useless population that is dragging the country down. Since then, it's gotten even worse since the Million Man March because now not only is the black man degraded, but the type of uh, videos that we put out with a black woman with a, a credit card using her hind parts as a strike for a credit card and we don't feel any shame for portraying our mother, our sister, our auntie, our grandmother in that kind of light and then use the B word to describe any woman is an insult. Whether it's done by a white person or a black person, no female who is made in the image and likeness of God should be called after the female side of a dog. But we have been lowered from what God made us into what the world has made us. So the language reflects that now. And the, and the things that we're doing to each other in the community reflect our hatred of self and each other. I, I want to get back to that point and talk to you about it, but do you think after the Million Man March, did you hope that there would be some sort of change? Do you look at that as something that didn't happen, a possible failure from the Million Man no, March? No, no, no. A lot of change came from the Million Man March. But there were those who feel threatened. I asked for a million, nearly two million men showed up. Well, the standing army of the United States of America is only two and a half million. So when you look at Farrakhan making a call of two million men, and it affected not only black men, but black women far beyond the, the ripple effect of the Million Man March, this man affected homes, not only in America, but around the earth. We can't let that happen. So because I am a Muslim, and 85% of those that came to the march were Christians, it was decided among certain elements of the Christian community that a Muslim should never have that kind of power to call Christians and Christians respond. So they took to the airwaves and they started referring to me in many places as the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So when I went around, I heard this. Doors that were open to me before the Million Man March closed because all of a sudden I became a threat. So there are forces that don't want to see the black man rise and the black man free and the black woman uplifted from a degraded state because there are those who make merchandise of us in the terrible condition that we're in at present. But there were some official estimates that said, oh, it was only 500,000. You said it's 2 million. They were unofficial. They passed themselves off as official to limit the crowd, to limit the effectiveness of the man that called it, to make it seem as though it was not what it was. Because if it was what it was, then you have to look at the man that God used to bring a crowd like that. No other black man or white man, for that matter, has been able to do anything like that. So who is Farrakhan? People have to question the magnetism of a man. Who magnetized him? He didn't magnetize himself. Who made him that attractive to black men? That's what made me dangerous to those powers that be, the satanic mind that governs this world. But I'm on Satan's trail by the grace of God. He can't do to me what he's done to others. He won't do to me what he's done to others. That's small time stuff today. 
what do you say, what about the language and the way we're portrayed and or we portray women in the videos? What about the N word, using the, the word? I'm very grateful to Reverend Jesse Jackson for taking the misstep of a uh, well-known comedian to sit us down at a common table and say that that word is unacceptable. We use it all the time. When I was very sick, Reverend Jackson came to the farm where I was and we did an hour and a half on the N-word. And I said to Reverend Jackson, and I say it now publicly, we can't just charge the rapper with that. I know great pastors who use that language in their private conversations. So we who are in leadership must take the oath that we will not use that degrading term to apply it to our brothers and sisters. That's how bad the language has changed from the 60s. When we were more conscious of our blackness, we never used the N-word. We called each other brother and sister, even though we may not have treated each other so much like a brother or sister. How are you, brother? How are you, sister? But today, yo, dog, what's up with you, dog? Are you a dog? That's an endearing term to a human to be classified as a dog. Then no wonder you call the woman the B word. If you are the dog, then you are the son of a B word. Oh, God. Some are saying it's taking the word back, the N word. We're taking the word back and we're using it the way we want it. We're going to make it a term of endearment. And you're so stupid to take a word that means your degradation and try to claim that you're using it for some uplifting purpose. If you used it for an uplifting purpose, why is the murder rate so high in the black community? Why are the funeral parlors filled with black men who call each other in? No, 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 no. You, if you change the language, you change the pattern of a man's thought. So if I uh, call you brother, I soon will want to recognize your flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, bone of my bone. So if I hurt my brother, I'm hurting myself. But if you're in a gang, you don't see the other gang member as your brother. He didn't, he's not wearing the right color, not showing the right signs, so kill him. So you're saying, taking back that word, that hogwash. You know, you can try to put a pretty face on a gargoyle, but it is what it is. The word is a degrading term, and we who use it, use it in a degrading manner. It's not a love term, because if it were love, the black community would not suffer what it is suffering from black-on-black -black violence, black-on-black -black crime. And those of us who understand want to see black-on-black -black love. And Jesus didn't say, love your in as you love yourself. He said, love your brother as you love yourself, so, or your neighbor. So you need to change the language that our people are using, or we need to change it. There was a song, James Brown, that said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. There's no N-word in that song. And it was much more powerful than any song I know with that word in it now. James Brown, uh, great, great, great icon. May God be pleased with him. He came along at a time of black consciousness where you had leaders now from the civil rights movement, from the black power movement, from the nationalist perspective, and from the religious community developing a black theology, and black was a term of real endearment, and we began to call each other black. James Brown, as a cultural icon, showed the way for artists, because the only way a good idea can have real traction is when a cultural icon takes the idea and transforms it into music and art and theater and books. 
and what not. So James Brown took the word black and put a beat to it and said, I'm black and I'm proud. But people were dancing to the beat, but he was driving the theme home. I'm black and I'm proud. And what he did for us as a people, he took the word that was so negatively thought of in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the early 50s, but now in the 60s and the 70s, James Brown made it popular to say, I'm black and I'm proud. And that's a tremendous contribution. We need another James Brown to use culture to give a better idea to our people. And we need leaders to stand up in this time period and be like the leaders were in the 60s, the 70s, and the early 80s. Let's talk about your legacy now. I, mean, I know you think it's vanity, but just for a moment, can you be vain while we're sitting here? How would you like people to remember you? As a person, first of all and foremost, that loved God, I adore him. I am enamored to live in the majesty of his creation. I love the word of God. And I love the people of God. I would like to be remembered as a person that was dutiful to God in his service of the most abject and fallen of human beings, my black brothers and sisters. I would like to be remembered as a man that was consistent, whom nobody could buy, and nobody could boss except God and his Christ. I refuse to bow down to man. No matter how much power you think you have, I've told my adversaries, as long as I'm with God and I stand on truth, ultimately, I will be the winner, living or dead. I would like people to know me better. Not just as the quote unquote fire and brimstone man, because that's the way I'm presented by media. I recently recorded with Denise Williams an arrangement by a great artist, Jerry Peters, under the direction of Charles Veal, my violin instructor and uh, conductor and arranger of the song is from Danny Boy, but the Christians say he looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. That's the way I live my life. I look beyond the faults of our people. I see their need and I try to touch it with the word that would inspire them to rise up and fulfill their needs. When Denise heard me play my violin, she said, oh, this is the underbelly of Farrakhan. I didn't understand the term at first, but she talked about a dog. And the outside seems so, mm -hmm. you know, strong and whatnot. But when you rub the underbelly, you see the dog react right. so much differently. This is the softer side of the animal. So she was saying, oh, this is a side of the minister that the world needs to see. And so I'm making an album, and believe it or not, on that album is represented the whole human family. Black and brown, that's Hispanic. Asian, white, Muslim, Christian, Jews, Buddhists, they surround Farrakhan. 
I want to say with my music what maybe I haven't been able to say with words. But I'm getting there. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us that the word of God, well, he, he suggested to me that if you talk harshly to white people about the historical injustice, they feel upset and they dismiss themselves from your presence. Mm -hmm. But if you play music, the white person that loves your music, he'll stay with you to the midnight hour. And when the nightclub closes, if you're having an after set, a jam session, he'll come because he's attracted by the power of music. So I said, I wonder if I could take the word of God and make it sound in the ear of a Caucasian as music. And I tried it out at the University of Illinois. The black students invited me. I went. I didn't have a quote unquote black message. I had a universal message. You had a violin. I didn't have any violin. This was the violin. And then I tried it out in the University of Kansas. 500 black students in a 2,500 seat auditorium, 2,000 whites. And when I came in, the state troopers had to lead me in because some of the students were outside jeering me. He killed Malcolm. He did this. He's no good. He's anti-Semitic and blah, blah, blah. When I went in, and approached the stage, the 500 black students stood up and cheered me. When I finished, the whole 3,000 stood and cheered. And when I walked out the door that they were jeering me coming in, they were cheering me going out. The value of this television is it can make me ugly by the way they photograph me, or it can make me pleasant just with a camera. The editors, because you know I've given you so much, the editors can cut it in such a way to make the minister look ugly. Because you can make Jesus look bad with a 30 second sound bite. And I've gone in churches and taken words that Jesus said and said, and imagine hearing this on the nightly news. Jesus said, you can't be my disciple unless you hate your mother, hate your father. Hate your sister, your brother, yea, even your own life. You're not worthy of me. Jesus, the hate teacher, was in Chicago tonight. Jesus said, think not that I come to bring peace, nay, a sword. I come to set the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, the son-in-law against the father-in-law. They of a man's household will be his own enemy. This is a very divisive man, this guy, Jesus. Then the man is a berserker. He goes in the temple and he beats up the people that were in the temple. He drives them out. Six o'clock news. Jesus, that violent one, came into the temple with a stick and drove out people that were just doing business. <laughs> you can make anybody look bad with a 30-second sound <laughs> fight. What I'm trying to say, don't do that to your brother. <laughs> kind of treat me nice. I'm, I'm done. And you know what? If you really listen to my words and listen to my heart and give this peace what it deserves, the world will open its doors and I can come in and I can help America. You can't talk to Ahmadinejad, but I can. That man is not unreasonable. You can talk to him, America, but you can't bully a man that believes in God. So when you tell them all options are on the table, so what? You throw, you don't know what you're going to get back. You called Iraq a slam dunk, but you missed the basket. And you lost the ball. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. I told you he's not sick because he's the one doing all the talking. Notice I'm not asking any questions. So let's, let's talk about this because you brought it up. I wasn't going to. How do you respond to people who say that you had something to do with Malcolm X? Oh, brother, 
I loved Malcolm. I loved him so much that I would have given my life for him because I saw him as the greatest helper of the man that I love most, which is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So when the time came that Brother Malcolm felt he had to leave the nation and he left and then criticized the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and castigated him in, in, as an immoral man, I felt it my duty to defend my leader and teacher, as did most of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's ministers. And that's why I said I was a party to the creation of the atmosphere that led to his assassination, and the FBI was involved, but they just sat back and watched it play out. A party with words. I'm sorry? You were a party by the words that you spoke? Yes. Or the words that I wrote. But when they quoted me, they never quoted me fully. They quoted the part that would make the minister look like he was a party to the murder of Malcolm. You're a young man. But at the time of Brother Malcolm's assassination, there were 11 daily newspapers in New York City. None of them were uh, sad over Malcolm's assassination. And Farrakhan never was mentioned for 20 years as any, having anything to do with the assassination of Brother Malcolm. The FBI was there. They know who was involved. The two brothers that said they weren't there and they weren't there were charged with it, and they took all kind of lie detector tests that showed that they, were, that they were innocent. But here's Farrakhan now. I start rising in the 80s. Malcolm dies or is assassinated in the 60s. Up until that time, Farrakhan is not mentioned at all. But the moment that I started to rise and thousands of people began to come out to hear what I had to say there was no so-called Negro leader on the scene that the media could use against me because my root is deep in the hood, if you pardon that expression. Mm -hmm. So they had to raise my brother from the grave and then say that I had something to do with Malcolm's murder, though I was never charged. I was never brought to any court. You could set up a grand jury now because there is no such thing as a statute of limitations on murder. You can't bring nothing to prove that Farrakhan had anything to do with the assassination of Brother Malcolm. But you put it out in the media. Why? Because you already label me anti-Semitic, anti-white, anti-gay, anti-American. Now all you have to do is to reach deep into the hood because now you've made a, a Malcolm, an icon. But Malcolm was the number one anti-Semite when he passed from this earth, according to the ADL. Now all of a sudden, the media that is controlled by members of the Jewish community, and that's not a canard, that's a fact. They bring my brother up from the grave and make him an icon in the world to use him against a living Farrakhan in hopes that a young gangbanger in love with Brother Malcolm would take a gun and murder Farrakhan. Okay. I'm I had nothing to do with his murder. I'm just letting you see the context of these things. I have a few more I've got to, I want to ask you about. So I'm going to say nothing to do with Malcolm X's death. No, absolutely not. I'm going to, I'm going to bring up something I just want you to, um, if you can expound on it shortly. Um, your childhood, what was that like growing up in the Bronx, or growing up in New York and then moving to Boston? Well, I didn't stay in New York that long. Um, when I was two, you moved. my mother went back to Bermuda, and so I passed my third birthday in Bermuda, and my fourth birthday was in Boston, Massachusetts, and that's where I grew up.
What I want to know, though, is how did that... Are you a different person now than you were? Is there a different you now? No. Are you the, still the same person? No. If you go back to Boston and meet my teachers in school or my friends, they'll tell you this is the same person, just more mature, more evolved. Many people were seeing things in me that I didn't see in myself as a child. So no, I'm not a changed person in that sense. I'm just evolved into what God had already birthed me into the world to be. You said you love God Absolutely. and the Word of God. What about your family? Your beautiful wife is sitting here. Oh, without a question. Because my wife and my children were sacrificed for this word. And if there's anything in life that I regret, it is the lack of balance. When I became so committed to the struggle of black people, I went away from my family. And my family knew that I was always preaching some word somewhere and I was not the father that I could have been, maybe that I should have been. Do you regret that? Of course I do. But my wife was the mother, the teacher, the guy, the friend that took up for me in my absence and made my children to know that daddy wasn't out cavorting, daddy was teaching, daddy was doing this. So my children, even though they felt something of missing their father, they loved me so much that today you look at my children. There are many children. One person that met my family said, you know, minister, there are many children that love their parents but they're not loyal to their parents. And what I found in your family is not only love, but a great sense of loyalty. Do you think Elijah Muhammad would be proud of you and what you've done with the nation? I hope so. I can't judge myself better than he can judge me. I hope that he would be proud of me and what I've attempted to do in his name. And I would like to hear the words that are written in the scripture. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. As thou hast been faithful over little, I'll make you ruler over much. Enter thou into thy joy. I promised in a speech at the Javits Center in New York where nearly 20,000 people came to hear Brother Farrakhan, I said, I will come back and I will speak to black men. Would you come? And they said yes. So it started in New York. And as I was in the heat of my message that night, I said, and it came out of my mouth and I watched it go out, I said, I want to take a million men to Washington, D.C. And as I watched the words go out, I couldn't call them back. There it was. That was the beginning of the Million Man March. My son was introducing me. I felt like a leaf that was caught in the wind. And it had no control over where it would go or where it would land a million black men. Nearly two million showed up. That means that we affected every black family in the United States of America. But the joy in which these black men related to each other, they wept. I saw and heard that black men just broke down and cried. Some people, men, hadn't seen each other for years and they 
found each other at the Million Man March. Some fathers ran into their sons at the Million Man March. I didn't know that I was special or would be special. I believed that one day I would be a great man. But God and his spirit has been with me from a little fellow. People would look at me and somehow they would tell my mother, I think he's going to be a preacher. I would laugh, you know, because I knew I was going to be an entertainer, some kind of musician. But those old folks knew what they were talking about. I grew up as a Christian, an Episcopalian. I sang in the choir. I was an acolyte. I did what young Christian boys do. But because I wanted to see black people free, I never heard that taught in church. My mother, being from the West Indies, on her mantelpiece was a picture of King George and Queen Elizabeth. And of course, there was a picture of Jesus, all three white. But when I went to my uncle's home, I saw nobody white on his mantelpiece. But above his mantelpiece was the picture of a black man. And I thought that that was strange. So I asked him, who is that man? He said, that's a man that came to unite black people. And I was a little short fellow, and so I asked him if he would get a chair. And I stood on the chair to drink in the features of this man. And I said, where is he that I can go and meet him? And he said, uh, he has passed away. And that man in that picture was Marcus Garvey. My uncle was the first in my family to become a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I visited the mosque in New York and Brother Malcolm was uh, speaking. And I had never heard any black man talk like this man talked. And after he started teaching, I was convinced that I was going to be a Muslim. I was like a little baby coming into something and everybody looked so kindly on a new baby with so much love and, and joy. That's the way they were looking at me. And uh, they asked me to speak. And I started to speak and I began to weep. Some of them began to look at me rather strange. I mean, a man crying, you know. But I was so touched by what I saw in the faces of these men, I said that night that I will take this teaching to every nook and every cranny or corner of the United States of America. That was October 1955. My mother always taught me as a child, when you're right, son, you can always fight. But when you're wrong, you can't be strong. She tried to abort me three times, she told me later. In those days, uh, in the 30s, you know, you didn't have money, she would use a hanger. And God did not let her abort me. So when I was 16, I was graduating from high school and she received this welfare check. And she took me with her to the welfare office. And she said to the person, I thank you 
for helping me to get both of my children through high school. This is my last son, and he has completed high school. She gave the woman back the check and said, I will take it from here. My mother was a, a beautiful black woman, very, very strict, stern, disciplinarian. I thank God for such a marvelous woman. She was real dark-skinned, and she made me to love black. And really, because of her, I am who I am. I am what I am. And I shall always be grateful to God for such a mother. And I would hope that every human being would have a mother that loved them like she loved. Not the hug, not the word, but the action. As far as I can remember, I have only one memory of my father, but my uncle, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. These four men were the greatest influence in my life. I was told by Brother Malcolm that I would be the minister in Boston because the two men that were there were constantly squabbling with each other so I went there with the thought in mind that I would be the minister. But when Brother Malcolm came up to appoint me, he appointed one of the two that was squabbling to be the minister. And he appointed me to be the captain of the FOI. And I served my minister very faithfully, very loyally. But whenever I taught and asked the people to accept, it looked as though the whole row of newcomers would just get up and join. And by May of 1957, the minister could no longer keep up the duty as a minister. And I was appointed the minister of mosque number 11 in Boston. My journey has been one, rebuild the mosque in Boston after a squabble broke it down. Two, when Brother Malcolm was assassinated, Elijah Muhammad called me and said, I am giving you his place. I never harmed Malcolm, but I did oppose him. I did argue with him. I did speak critically of him in defense of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But plot his death and harm him, that I did not do. I had no part whatsoever in the assassination of Malcolm, but we in the nation could say we are generally guilty because we had a mind Mr. to see him home, even if we didn't do it ourselves because we hated what he did to his benefactor. much this people hates me. For what? Because I teach you the truth. That's all. They know that I'm doing a better job with you than any uh, one ever appeared among you. Imam Warathuddin, his son, took over the leadership of the nation and I submitted to him, although we were at odds. 
I disagreed with his characterization of the teacher of his father and even some of his words concerning his father. I was very, very despondent over the way the nation had turned, not knowing what to do with my life and the future. I was trying to pursue a show business. You are a witness that for the last 16 going on 17 years, I have withstood a blistering attack, not only by whites and the government, but by my own brothers and sisters who were afraid of the um, consequences of association with me. Sometimes when you have character and you stand up for what you believe is right, some people will not understand that and become offended by that. People say that he, he, Farrakhan has a lot of courage. It's not that I'm courageous. I don't call it courage. I just love God. And I remember at around five, going on six, my mother gave me the violin and gave my brother the piano and found us uh, teachers. It seemed like from when I can remember, I was always on stage. And with the violin, you know, my, my peers, when they would have me play in grammar school, play at programs, my peers would be amazed at, at what I could do. And then I was singing in the choir. And then I learned that I had a voice and I started singing in nightclubs, ballads. And since my parents were from the Caribbean, I learned to sing Calypso from some of the great Calypsonians of that time. It is my hope that my performance will inspire young people to want to go pick up a violin and a viola or a cello, get involved in the strings and the classics. The greatest violinist to me was a man named Yasha Heifetz, who was a Russian Jew. My first uh, great teacher in Boston was a Russian Jew. My teacher today is a Russian Jew. There's no way that I could play the violin and be antagonistic toward Jews when some of them are the greatest artists and some of them have been the greatest writers, composers. My teachers are black, my teachers are white. My teachers are Christians, my teachers are Jews, my teachers are Muslims. I think I've had a universal upbringing. Let's bring on Minister Louis Farrakhan. So this is about change. Change. And you are on the cutting edge of that change. Is a song that I used to hear sung when I was in show business a few days ago. It said, there'll be a change in the weather a change in the sea. From now on, there'll be a change in me. I wanted them to know that they were in a position of leadership. And I wanted to encourage them to accept the responsibility of leadership. I'm blessed 
because my children love me. I hemorrhaged here at this farm and my son uh, wrapped me in a towel and we put on some kind of clothes and they rushed me to the hospital. They had a, a cartoon that came out in the New York Post of two Jewish doctors operating on my father with a saw in their hand with lines going across the neck talking about we're going to remove the cancer or basically cutting off his head. And that is the backdrop of us trying to make a decision of where we're going to take the minister. Other things was happening, blood um, pouring out of him and he doesn't want to go to the hospital. Your mind, you're thinking so many things could die. We drove. When he got to that hospital, they had to give him some type of uh, medication to stop the pain and the medication that they gave him caused them to be in more pain and as honest to God I felt this was my sentiment that if my father died on this table he's not going to be the only one that died I know that my brothers and sisters and my mother would get their cue off of me and if I started to panic and let them know just how severe it was, that wouldn't have been a very good thing. Several times I cried and I was just thanking the Almighty God for restoring his uh, life back to us because we truly almost lost the minister. I thank God for this period of my suffering because literally God arrested me to rest me. Elijah Muhammad told me, find a way to unite with the Muslim world. He didn't tell me how to do it. He just told me to do it. The most beautiful thing happened December 1999. Imam Warathuddin, his brother, Elijah Muhammad II, his daughter, and his secretary visited me, and we had a luncheon together, and I asked him if he would be my guest at Savior's Day 2000. I wanted to say that the Imam and I will be together until death overtakes us. I was invited as the first non-Iranian to speak and there were approximately six million people in the square and in the side streets looking by screen and listening by television and radio. It was um, a tremendous outpouring. The people held me in such high regard after hearing me till they just wanted to touch me. And in many countries when my plane landed, the people were all in the uh, airport and on the tarmac singing songs of welcome. Every black leader who tried to connect us to the international struggle of poor and black people became an enemy that was dealt with by the government of the United States of America. Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, Malcolm X, Martin King, anybody that connected us to the suffering reality of third world people became a threat. I would like my children to say to me, we watched you all your life struggle.
to see the rise of black people. Take your rest. We will carry on this mission until black people all over this earth are free and human beings can live a dignified life without oppression and ignorance as the constant burden. <laughs>